distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. On behalf of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, BIISS, I welcome you all to today's seminar on Climate Diplomacy, Conference and Choices for Bangladesh. Today, we are very honored to have amongst us His Excellency, Dr. Shamsul Alam, Honorable Minister of State, Ministry of Planning, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh as the Chief Guest. We are also glad to have Professor Salimul Haq, Director, International Center for Climate Change and Development as a special guest. Respected audience, today's program is divided into two sessions. First, we'll have the inaugural session, which is followed by the working session. The inaugural session will begin with a welcome address by Colonel N. A. Sadi, AFWC, PSC, Acting Director General of the IISS. This will be followed by the speech of the special guest and then the Honorable Chief Guest. The inaugural session will be chaired by Ambassador Kazi Imtiaz Hussain, PAA, Chairman BIISS. May I now request the chair of the session to kindly commence the event. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Aisha. And uh, Salaam Alaikum. And uh, a very good morning uh, to all of you to uh, today's session which we have titled as Climate Diplomacy, Constraint and Choices. Uh, we are very honored to have a presence of a very distinguished uh, participants here. Uh, but most importantly, and uh, we are very grateful uh, to the Honorable State Minister for Planning to have graced this occasion as uh, our chief guest and uh, uh, Professor Salimul Haq uh, as a special guest. I'm uh, also uh, very pleased to see Professor Anwar Hussain and Mr. Rahman uh, to have joined us uh, on this important session. Uh, climate change, as we, uh, we very well know, is, uh, is uh, the most crucial issue uh, faced uh, now globally. Uh, no doubt coming uh, after a year or so, Close to a year, we will be having the 27th uh, conference at Sharm el Sheikh, uh, which will again be uh, a global event uh, attracting uh, millions uh, around the world, billions around the world, uh, to see what uh, path we chart for saving this uh, world from the disaster that is ensuing and has been taking place. But we, before we get into uh, uh, our uh, discussion today, and, and we listen to our honorable uh, chief guest and special guest. I would request uh, the acting director, General Colonel Saadi, uh, to kindly uh, deliver his welcome remarks. Colonel Saadi. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable Chief Guest, His Excellency Dr. Shamshul Alam, Honorable Minister of State, Ministry of Planning, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Honorable Special Guest, Professor Salimul Haq, Director International Center for Climate Change and Development, Respected Chair, Ambassador Kaji. Imtiaz Hussain, learned panelists, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. On behalf of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, let me welcome you all to today's hybrid seminar on climate diplomacy, constraints, and choices for Bangladesh. Our heartfelt gratitude to the honorable chief guest and the special guest for gracing the occasion. At the outset, I would like to pay my homage to the memory of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mojibur Rahman, and for the millions who sacrificed, sacrificed their lives for our independence. Distinguished guests, climate change has become a major threat to human existence. Both human actions and the consequent human inactions 
are creating planet, planetary crises like climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. However, the most alarming is these crises are affecting the planet in an unjust and disproportional way. In that context, climate diplomacy and negotiation become a sophisticated tool to address the environmental threats and adverse impacts of climate change across the globe. Besides, climate diplomacy emerged as a crucial instrument to mobilize the responsible countries to share the burden and compensate to the countries suffer from climate change induced losses and damages. Dear audience, Bangladesh, as one of the most climate vulnerable countries, is actively pursuing the cause of environmental justice in international forums. Moreover, the country has led the Climate Vulnerable Forum and has translated its vulnerability into resilience through different climate actions and diplomatic efforts. Under Bangladesh's presidency, the Climate Vulnerable Forum emerged as a legitimate voice for the most climate affected countries that played a significant role in declaring the Glasgow Declaration in COP26. Bangladesh is one of the pioneering countries to submit nationally determinant contributors as the condition of the Paris Agreement. Bangladesh has prepared Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, which is also working as a guiding star for climate vulnerable countries. The country has developed Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan, which emphasizes on negotiation involving experts and voice at various levels to address the impact of climate change. Bangladesh also addressed the National Adaptation Program for Action to address the impacts of climate change. Furthermore, Bangladesh is strongly advocating the idea of loss and damage to ensure economic compensation by the greenhouse gas contributing countries for the countries most vulnerable to threats from the climate change. Therefore, in the upcoming COP27, Bangladesh could play a pivotal role and raise its voice regarding the implementation of the Green Climate Fund, which is far away from the commitments made by the developed countries, as well as raise the issue of compensation for the losses and damages, sufficient financing for adaptation and resilience building. Ladies and gentlemen, hope we could learn more on the different issues of climate diplomacy and Bangladesh's role from our today's learned panelists and also from the open discussion. Finally, again, I express my gratitude to the honorable chief guest and special guest and the learned audience for your kind participation. Thank you very much. Joy Bangla. Thank you, Acting Director General, uh, General Emma Saadi, uh, for your welcome remarks. Uh, but before I uh, uh, invite and request our special guest to deliver his statement. I would like to uh, say a few words uh, uh, for this learned audience. Uh, and if I may take the podium, that perhaps would be better. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. Honorable State Minister for Planning, uh, Dr. Shamshul Alam, Professor Salim al uh, Director International Center for Climate Change and Development, Ambassador Shamshul Mubin Chaudhary, who will be chairing the working session. And we expect him to be joining us uh, shortly. Distinguished panelists uh, for today's uh, seminar, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
uh, I again uh, warmly extend my uh, extend my warm welcome to all of you and all of those who are present here in, in the auditorium and those who have joined us virtually. Uh, I would again like to express our gratitude and thank to the honorable chief guest and special guest for their kind presence today. Uh, climate change as uh, has been uh, very uh, eloquently mentioned by our acting director John that has changed and emerged as a mortal threat for uh, our planet. And, and Bangladesh is uh, undoubtedly one of the most uh, climate uh, vulnerable countries. Steep climate events are severely impacting life and livelihoods of millions. Uh, one of the statistics that I've been looking at uh, before coming to the seminar that uh, between 20, uh, eight, uh, 2008 and 2021, in this year, uh, over 400,000 Bangladeshis have been uh, displaced internally. And, and the predictions are if there is a, a one meter rise in a sea level, millions of, of people will be displaced. Economic loss of from the climate change impact is uh, severe. The recent flood in, in, uh, in Sunam Ganj and Silet uh, was recorded to be uh, severe most in 122 years of recorded history of, of flooding in the country. Over a billion US dollar was lost in damages and destruction to properties. Climate change uh, threatens to erode our development gains and uh, is uh, estimated that around 2% uh, of a GDP is uh, lost annually and it uh, uh, is apprehended that it can run into uh, close to uh, uh, two digits, double digit, digit. It can go up to 9%. Bangladesh has, uh, has invested in uh, climate building climate resilience. resilience. Uh, over $10 billion has been invested to build the uh, the resilience of the community of the country and facing and addressing the impact of climate change. Now, coming uh, to uh, the uh, 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 27th uh, conference of parties in Sharma uh, Sheikh, uh, it's perhaps a good time to uh, have a a look at what happened at uh, 2021 COP at uh, at Glasgow. Now, there has been a feeling that Glasgow uh, was, uh, was an, again an opportunity lost, uh, lost in terms of addressing the, the fate of the millions of people, addressing the fate of the earth, which is uh, continuously being threatened by uh, human induced uh, global warming and, and actions. Now, a, a few things that uh, did not materialize and a uh, few things that did materialize uh, is something that to, has to be looked into as we approach and uh, go to uh, the uh, conference in Sharma uh, One was that there was again a reaffirmation of uh, global leaders that uh, uh, the uh, temperature, global temperature, uh, be kept at 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. There was again uh, uh, a, a positive tone that uh, adaptation fund would be uh, uh, increased. Again, the disappointment was that the uh, developed countries has not been meeting its commitment in terms of providing uh, financial support. The hundred billion dollars commitment made in two thousand nine, uh, and then uh, reviewed again uh, in nineteen going to twenty twenty five. Uh, has only reached $80 billion till 2019. And, and that the distribution itself is uh, faulty, that 80% of that uh, uh, is, uh, has, has gone into uh, the, uh, what it says, uh, uh, for, for mitigation and only 25% uh, of that, meaning 8 to 20 billion uh, was, uh, has, has gone to uh, adaptation. Now, uh, coming into uh, 2000 uh, of this year's uh, Sharma Sheikh event, uh, few things will uh, surface. And, and uh, here I would uh, like to mention uh, the uh, leading role that Bangladesh played as the chair of the CBF. The Honorable Prime Minister had made four very specific proposals at uh, the uh, conference. And First, that uh, we must limit uh, the global emission. 
Second, that uh, the developed countries must uh, provide their uh, meet up the commitment of hundred billion dollars uh, and provide the funding, and then that distribution has to be on an equal basis, equal in basis to mitigation and adaptation, and wherein the the developed countries must also uh, keep in mind the interests of the developing world, which is most threatened. And some of the island countries, as we all know, are facing existential uh, threat. The uh, third most important point that uh, the Honorable Prime Minister has made is that the, uh, the issue of loss and damage has to be uh, addressed uh, properly. And, and that uh, should also uh, include a global sharing of responsibility for climate refugees, and, and just mentioned that over 400,000 has been displaced in, in, uh, in about a, a decade's time in Bangladesh alone. Uh, these issues, I believe, will, uh, will again emerge and will be uh, the, the, the point that uh, will either make or break the COP27. Uh, in the course of the next uh, hour and a half, we will explore these uh, aspects and and uh, while we look into them then it, it becomes very very important that the uh, voice of the developing world gets united as the forum uh, had indicated that a united and uh, uh, voice can uh, create the environment and lead to a successful outcome of the uh, cop 27. Uh, with those words, may I now uh, have the honor and privilege to request uh, Prof. Salim Uthak to kindly uh, come to the podium and uh, make his statement. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, um, Honorable Chief Guest, uh, Director General of BIS. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, good morning, assalamu alaikum. It's my great pleasure to be here uh, today, and I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak. So what I'm going to do is to take the title of today's meeting, which is Climate Diplomacy, Constraints and Choices for Bangladesh, in three parts, which I'll characterize as yesterday's narrative, today's narrative, and tomorrow's narrative. Yesterday's narrative uh, coincides with the word constraints in the title of today, the climate change problem. This is now something that does not need to be explained. 10, 20 years ago when Dr. Atik Brahman and I started working on this, we had to explain it. We don't have to explain it anymore. Uh, if all you have to do is watch your television screens and you'll have seen the destruction that Hurricane uh, Ian has brought to the United States, first to Florida and then now to South Carolina, the latest death toll is about 87, and that's not going to stop there. It's going to get longer as they find more dead bodies uh, in that part. And the, the amount of uh, damage estimates every single day go up by roughly $10 billion. It's reached about 60 or $70 billion already, and it's not, that's not the limit. It's going to get even bigger. So the climate change problem is now a well-recognized problem that does not need to be explained anymore. So I'm not going to spend time describing the problem. I'll move to today's narrative, which is that this is a global problem that has just started to hit us. It's happening now. It's not no longer something that's going to happen in the future. We have 30 years to think of it as something that will happen. That's over. We are now in it. It's happening. Every day it's happening somewhere in the world, which means that the future world is going to be very, very, very different from the past world. And to give you an inkling of how it's going to be different, we have two very good examples. We had the COVID-19 pandemic for two years. We have the Russia-Ukraine war going on right now. Put them together, and that's climate change going forward it's going to get a lot worse and we have to prepare for it. And when I say we, not just Bangladesh, every single country in the world individually and collectively, and we are not ready to do that. We have to get ready to do that much better. And so that brings me to my uh, today's narrative of what can we do as Bangladesh, the country. And we've already heard several 
examples of Bangladesh taking a very proactive role in developing our own national climate change strategy and action plan. Uh, Bangladesh has its own Bangladesh Delta plan to 2100. Uh, we have a, a prospective plan to 2041, and we have the latest uh, ac activity on the Mujib climate prosperity plan uh, that was done under the leadership of Bangladesh's uh, chairmanship of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Uh, in diplomacy terms, Bangladesh has been a very, very active member of the least developed countries group in the negotiations in, inside the UNFCC process. Uh, and more recently, we have chaired, uh, Honorable Prime Minister was the chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is a political forum of uh, 55 uh, vulnerable developing countries. Uh, she chaired it for the last two years, including uh, representing the group in Glasgow at the COP26 um, event. She has recently handed over the chairmanship to the president of Ghana, uh, who is leading it now and will lead it in Sharm el Sheikh in COP27. And as it happens right now, today, there is a pre COP meeting taking place in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where Ghana is chairing the Climate Vulnerable Forum. But that does not mean the fact that Ghana has taken over the chairmanship does not mean Bangladesh no longer has a role to play. The Climate Vulnerable Forum governance system is based on a troika governance system, which is the current chair and the two previous chairs. And the term period of the chair is two years. So Ghana will be the chair for two years. Bangladesh remains a member of the troika for the Ghana presidency. And then when Ghana hands over to Ghana's successor for another two years, Bangladesh still remains in the troika on the governance. So Bangladesh's role as a leader of the Climate Vulnerable Forum has not come to an end. We still are part of the leadership and can speak on behalf of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And we hope that Bangladesh's uh, foreign uh, ministry in particular, which has been leading on this, uh, will play that role going forward. Just because Ghana has taken over doesn't mean that we forget everything we did for the last two years. We can continue to do that. So a very big opportunity for our diplomats. So let me now uh, come to the third and final part, part of my uh, um, talk, which is on the challenges. And in my view, uh, I like to call them uh, uh, choices and opportunities uh, of how we can place Bangladesh going forward. And by forward, I don't mean tomorrow. I don't mean uh, in November at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, but COP28, COP29, COP30, going forward over the next few years as this problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger globally. There's no doubt that it's going to get bigger and we are not ready for it. And so we need to become uh, leaders in tackling climate change. And I believe that we have the foundation for doing that in Bangladesh. We are a world leader in adaptation to climate change, particularly locally led adaptation which Bangladesh is a, global, a globally recognized world leader. Um, we can build on that. Bangladeshi scientists, Bangladeshi academics, Bangladeshi NGOs, civil society, and the government of Bangladesh has been taking this very, very seriously and investing in developing our knowledge and our activities. We are not perfect. We have not solved all the problems. We are still a vulnerable country, but vulnerability is no longer our selling point. Our selling point is we are a resilient country. We are becoming a resilient country. We want to become one of the most resilient countries. So instead of calling ourselves one of the most vulnerable countries, which we used to do for a long time, we want to call ourselves one of the most resilient countries going forward and proving by showing our resilience. And here, the last part of my uh, talk is the role of diplomacy, and in particular, the role of diplomats, Bangladeshi diplomats. In my view, the diplomats have a very, very important role to play in taking Bangladesh's leadership on climate change forward. It's no longer just asking for money, demanding money. That is, again, yesterday's story. We'll do that. I'm not saying we stop doing that. But we have to go beyond that. We have to tell the United States, you guys don't know how to tackle climate change. We can tell you how to tackle climate change. We can share it with the rest of the uh, developing countries who are vulnerable developing countries. And in fact, in my center at ICAD at Independent University, we regularly run uh, uh, training courses for um, people from least developed countries. 
to come to Bangladesh and learn from Bangladesh on how to adapt to the impact of climate change. And as I said, Bangladesh is recognized as a global leader and other countries are very interested in learning from us. So what do our diplomats have to do? They have to do more than just go to the annual conference of parties and do speeches and shouting and demanding and then come back with not very much achieved. That we have to keep doing, we have to keep pushing. I'm not saying we, no, we don't do it, but we have to be realistic. It's not really doing very much. It's moving incrementally forward where the problem is leaping forward. We are not staying uh, uh, abreast with the problem. So we have to do better. We also have the opportunity of the Climate Vulnerable Forum leadership that I mentioned something we should not lose. We have four more years of CBF uh, leadership position. We need to be utilizing that strategically. At the same time, the role of Bangladeshi diplomats, wherever they are posted, uh, whether they are in Addis Ababa or in uh, uh, Seoul or in Japan, they have to do climate diplomacy. Whether or not there's a, a climate meeting that they are attending, Every single day when they talk to their counterparts, the host countries, the host countries will talk to them about climate change and ask them, what is Bangladesh doing about climate change? The diplomat needs to know what is Bangladesh doing, needs to be able to engage with his counterparts, his or her counterparts on the story of Bangladesh, but more than the story of Bangladesh, on the offer that Bangladesh now can have tomorrow, not today, tomorrow, to help every other country tackle climate change, all right? We will become a knowledge sharer, a knowledge broker to extend our hand of friendship and support. We will support them. We will support the United States of America. We will support Germany in how to tackle climate change. The Germans have already acknowledged that they need to learn from us. And so we need to put in place our ability to do that. I'm now projecting it into the future. We're not in a position to do it now, but if we invest in building our capacity to do that, scientists, NGOs, government, all of us at the national level, but our diplomats as well, taking the message at the global level, in five to 10 years time, Bangladesh can be recognized globally as a genuine leader in tackling this global problem that is going to get worse everywhere, by the way. Everybody's going to be suffering even more going forward, and they will look to us because Bangladesh will have been recognized as a country that has managed. We have not solved everything. We have not, not a perfect country, but we are in the process of tackling it in a whole of government, whole of society approach, which I believe that we are well on the way to doing. And I'm very, very uh, uh, glad that the BIS um, has taken this initiative. The foreign ministry has also taken this initiative for the last two years. Uh, my center has been doing a, a short course on climate diplomacy for our uh, um, a young diplomats, our uh, first batch of diplomats. That's a very good thing, but we need to do more than that going forward. So I'd be very happy to discuss with uh, our, the BIS colleagues on how we can make this into an ongoing program to capacitate Bangladesh's diplomats across the board on climate diplomacy, which is a new and emerging subject in its own right uh, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Salim Al-Haq for your uh, very encouraging and uh, intervention. I mean, uh, it, it's true that Bangladesh uh, has been uh, in a leadership role at the, as the chair of the CBF, but as you very rightly pointed out, our role has not ended with the two years uh, chairmanship of uh, Climate Vulnerable Forum. It continues uh, into, and, and beyond that, and. Uh, and, and the most uh, encouraging thing is that the uh, that we have through years of uh, practical experience built up that capacity, and now we are in a position to uh, receive global acknowledgement and recognition. Ban Ki Moon has had a very the former Secretary General has uh, mentioned Bangladesh as as a role model in adaptation. So the uh, the advantage Bangladesh has is uh, not only. As, as, a, uh, as a country which is uh, uh, which can demand global respect, but also show uh, uh, showing the way to others how to deal with these uh, calamities and, and disasters, uh, which, which is going to increase uh, in its intensity and frequency 
uh, even more so unless uh, effective actions are taken. Um, thank you, sir, for your uh, very insightful uh, intervention. May I now have the honor and, and, and privilege to request our uh, Chief Guest, Honorable State Minister for Planning, Dr. Shamsul Haq, to kindly deliver his name, sir. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ambassador Kadi Imtiaz Hussein, Chairman BIISS, and uh, Professor Salimul Haq, Director of International Center for Climate Change and Development, with the uh, uh, distinguished luminary uh, in climate discussions. And uh, you heard his very succinct and focused you know, discussion on yesterday's narratives, today's narrative, and tomorrow's narratives in terms of ensuring climate you know, uh, issues, uh, discussions that will be held in COP uh, also, uh, COP27. Uh, here we have with us Colonel. M.S. Hadi, PSC Acting Director General, BIISS, and distinguished participants, and ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. A very good morning to you all. It's afternoon, actually. Uh, good noon, but at 12.05, anyway. It is indeed a great honor for me uh, to join today's hybrid seminar on climate diplomacy constraints and choices for Bangladesh. I do adhere that the topic of today's seminar is particularly timely ahead of uh, COP27 uh, to be held in November, as you heard. <clears throat> I would like to extend my appreciation and heartfelt thanks to the Bangladesh Institute of International Strategic Studies, a notable think tank, uh, the country for organizing this seminar. At the very outset, uh, I pay my deepest homage to the greatest Bengali of all times, Father of the Nation, architect of independent Bangladesh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibaraman, and all the martyrs who have sacrificed their lives for the freedom of the nation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh is considered as one of the most climate vulnerable countries and uh, in the world, notwithstanding, uh, contributing less than 0.47% of global emissions. That's the usual narrative, uh, but uh, from now on, certainly Bangladesh is uh, not only a vulnerable country, it's a, a very resilient country, as described by our honorable uh, Salim al -Hab. The impacts of climate change will put severe stress on a limited land and resources. Climate change, along with sea level rise, induce salinity, and other disasters are damaging our rice and crop production significantly. Sea level rise alone will be responsible for 0.5. 5.8 to 9.1 percent of decline of rice production uh, in the future. This is not only with you know sea level rise because of temperature rise, there will be you no know, low lower production uh, because of uh, temperature rise. Besides, just one uh, degree Celsius increase in global temperature and further sea level rise will result in the inundation of a large area of uh, the country and followed by displacement of 40 million people by the end of the century. Actually, when I prepared Bangladesh Delta Plan, led the preparation of Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100, uh, we estimated using the Bangladesh Meteorological Department data, we found that uh, in Dhaka city, climate uh, already has risen to 0.8 degrees Celsius during the period of 
the data we used from 1972 to uh, 2016. In this period, climate, I mean, temperature has risen to 0.8 degrees Celsius. It's quite, you know, big increase uh, in terms of temperature. So uh, it is obvious, no more hopes that there will be temperature rise. In recent times, intense climate-related disasters such as floods, droughts, are also on the rise. <coughs> Uh, also, uh, with the climate change, uh, we have been facing you now rainfall variability, and I don't know why reduction of total rainfall, average rainfall annually. And the period I referred to, uh, the study period with the meteorology department data uh, during the period 1972 to 2016, our rainfall as total rainfall, you know, annual rainfall uh, on a decadal basis, we use 10 year average because the yearly fluctuation may not reflect the true trend. So, with decadal uh, change, uh, we found that uh, the total temperature, average temperature, annual temperature was uh, around something uh, around 600. Uh, millimeter of rainfall that came down to around 400 millimeter on a decadal basis, and that should be the true reflection of the trend, real trend. Meaning, uh, there has been high variability of rainfall, and uh, in total terms, rainfall has also amount of rainfall has also uh, reduced. So that will affect agriculture, ecology, everything. Anyway, earlier this year, almost three fourths of the select region was inundated due to the heaviest rainfall of the region has seen in the last hundred years. So it's an unusual phenomenon. This time, it is observed that Purigram also experienced the worst flooding, worst flooding and drought within a span of two weeks. It is, almost, it is also alarming that 2% of the GDP is regularly lost due to recurrent natural calamities and environmental degradation. Hence, climate change poses an existential threat to over 165 million people of the country. Actually, climate change affects everything, not only people, you know, ecology, environment, natural resources, uh, everything. Bangladesh has hardly contributed to the deterioration of the environment. In addition, we are trying to address the challenges of climate impact sourced from 1.1 million forcibly displaced uh, Myanmar nationals or Rohingyas. This phenomenon is not only impacting our land and environment severely, but also our development and adaptation efforts. They denoted many you know, forest lands, uh, as you already know. Distinguished guests, under the visionary leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh strives for shifting the country's vulnerability towards resilience. Uh, we have established the Bangladesh Climate Change Trust Fund, uh, BCCTF, as you know it. In 2009, for climate adaptation, and have allocated over US dollar 480 million from our resources to implement over 800 mitigation and adaptation programs. In our annual development plan, the climate relevant allocation has been doubled, which increased from about US dollar. 1.44 billion in fiscal year 2015-2016 uh, to about US dollar 2.96 billion in financial year, last financial year 2021-22. For climate adaptation and resilience building, we have taken various steps such as the construction of the dikes. We are improving our folders, uh, what we have, 
uh, we have 139 C folders and uh, gradually we are trying to uh, rebuild those and uh, uh, rising those you know from 4.5 uh, meter to 6 meter up to 6 meter uh, the cities we are building cyclone centers and initiatives of coastal plantations you know uh, were there Moreover, our government has taken a number of initiatives to rehabilitate climate displaced people. We are implementing the world's biggest housing project, namely Kruskul Asan Prokolpo, for people displaced by the impacts of climate change in Cox's Bazar. With the construction of 139 multi storey buildings, along with ensuring all amenities to shelter. 4,409 climate change affected families are accommodated there. Under the ASRAN project, a landmark initiative of the government for the landless and homeless people, a total of 442,608 families, meaning 442,608 families have been given houses. Besides, the project also focuses on mitigation of climate change through implementing tree plantation, rainwater harvesting, solar home systems, and improved cook stoves. With a view to commemorating the birth centenary of the father, father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the government has planted 10 million trees in 2020. Uh, learned audience, the government has also adopted the Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100. Uh, we uh, completed the preparation of this Delta Plan, you know, spending four years and a half. We started preparation uh, since 2012, in 2014, and then we completed in 2018. Uh, uh, it was approved in the National Economic Council uh, in uh, September 2018. And from then on, uh, it has been in implementation. Up until now, we, uh, we are implementing 22 projects to ADP out of 80 projects suggested uh, in the investment part of the plan. We suggested 80 projects. Uh, amounting to no 37 billion US dollar. So of that 22 already uh, no, uh, have been included in the ADP and uh, were put into operation. That is a uh, learned audience. But besides this, our new national adaptation plan what is known as NAP in short, will be the main vehicle to address adaptation and the national level, which intends to reduce vulnerability to the impacts of climate change by building adaptive, uh, adaptive capacity and resilience to new and existing policies and programs. NAP will surely enable us to implement long-term coordinated climate adaptation programs. In the Delta plan, we also you know, emphasized nature-based solution. And uh, we emphasize a lot uh, as our natural resource, resources may not degrade. On mitigation, we have put emphasis on renewable energy, its efficiency, and conservation. It is crucial to highlight that Bangladesh has one of the world's most extensive domestic solar energy programs. Bangladesh made a clear commitment to stop using coal-based power plants. And we have already canceled 10 coal-based uh, coal power plants with the worth you are to a blend of foreign investment. Of course, nowadays, uh, Germany also again started using coal plants uh, because of energy shortage, gas shortage in Germany. Anyway, uh, up until now, we are holding the view that we should not go with, you know, further go with 
uh, coal plants for electricity generation. Distinguished guests, Bharat has become a significant player in global climate diplomacy. During our presidency of Climate Vulnerable Forum, the country emerged as a legitimate voice in the climate change negotiation under the able leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And you know what role we played with this uh, climate uh, vulnerable forum under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, as you heard from uh, Dr. Solomon Hawk also. <clears throat> we have launched the Muji uh, Climate Prosperity Plan with the aim to put Bangladesh on a journey from climate vulnerability to resilience to climate prosperity. It is indeed one of the landmark policy guidelines for climate vulnerable countries. Bangladesh is one of the pioneers in submitting nationally determined contribution, which in short uh, is said NDC. As a prerequisite for the Paris Agreement and Kyoto Protocol, Bangladesh asked the world community to submit their NDC and in response to the 70 countries have already submitted their NDCs, nationally determined contributions, uh, reports. Bangla besides, Bangladesh has created the Climate Vulnerability Forum and V20, which is in short known V20, Vulnerable 20, joint multi-donor fund for supporting climate action among the members. In, Bangla in addition, Bangladesh is ready to support other vulnerable countries to develop their own prosperity plans. We are sharing the best practices and adaptation knowledge with other climate vulnerable countries through the Global Center on Adaptation South Asia Regional Office, which is located in Dhaka. Learned audience, our government has given utmost priority to climate diplomacy. Hence, Bangladesh feels to continue enhance international climate cooperation through advocacy and outreach. Bangladesh firmly believes that climate change is a security issue and it must be discussed at a regular interval at the United Nations Security Council. The strict implementation of the Paris Agreement is necessary to reduce the adverse impact of the climate change. This is high time. Uh, the major emitters need to meet the mitigation uh, <clears throat> target swiftly. Besides, the issue of loss and damage must be addressed with utmost importance. The international community must support the vulnerable developing countries with financial resources and appropriate technology in support of the electrician efforts. And for that, uh, for evolving technology, we need to invest more on you know, uh, climate researches. Furthermore, all leaders need to promote inclusive climate action on an urgent basis. We look forward to the 27th session of the Conference of the Parties, which is known as COP, you know. Conference of the Parties of the UNFCCC, commonly known as COP27, to be held from 6 to 18 November in Sham al, Sham el Sheikh, Egypt, for having more focused actions, particularly on climate finance and climate justice, which are essential for meeting the long term goals of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Development Agenda, which is known as SDG. Ladies and gentlemen, this seminar has given us ample opportunity through sharing ideas and experiences from the scholars and climate dis diplomacy of Bangladesh. Um, experience of the, from the scholars on climate diplomacy of Bangladesh. I firmly believe that the exchange of ideas in today's seminar will certainly help to generate a better understanding of the contemporary constraints and choices for Bangladesh regarding the issues of climate change and climate diplomacy. I also expect this seminar will be able to shed light on the key concerns of Bangladesh for the upcoming COP27. With these high notes, I would like to thank again DIISS for organizing this seminar and inviting me to be amongst you as the chief guest.
I thank you all for participation and patience hearing. I look forward to have positive and useful outcomes from this learned discourse. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Honorable uh, State Minister, uh, for uh, detailing uh, not only uh, what Bangladesh has done in terms of putting in place plans and policies and, and, and the projects that have been taken to build uh, resilience of the country. And, and as uh, Professor Salimul had, uh, had also indicated, that we should uh, now move on to showcase Bangladesh as a resilient country much more than as a vulnerable country. And then the Honorable State Minister has uh, provided uh, the uh, broad framework which, uh, which guide us uh, not only uh, in the next 10 years, 20 years, but through the, in this entire century to build uh, a resilience, uh, sustainable and a prosperous uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh built up as an, a chief architect of that uh, plan. Uh, looks uh, uh, into the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the challenges that is uh, faced by the country, but also uh, how to read uh, it in a manner which is sustainable uh, and, and make the country uh, prosperous and its people. I'd like to thank you, sir, for your uh, very detailed uh, intervention statement. And, uh, with that, uh, we come to the end of the uh, first segment of our uh, seminar today, uh, and we'll invite you to have tea, I believe, uh, uh, a short break for that. Yeah. And in the next session, uh, which is uh, going to be a working session, we will have uh, uh, Ambassador Shamshir Mubin chairing the session, if I am uh, correct, because uh, I see his. Uh, his chair is still uh, uh, vacant, he's on his way, uh, and he should be joining us shortly, but we will have uh, four distinguished panelists, uh, uh, starting from uh, Professor uh, Mizan Rahman, we have a, a, a representative from UNDP, uh, Mr. Faisal. We also have a government representative, Mr. Shokat, uh, and then we have our own uh, uh, in-house expert, uh, Dr. Sophia, to uh, take us through this very important uh, session. But uh, before we commence that, uh, let's have a short break uh, and uh, enjoy a cup of uh, tea and, and coffee. Thank you very much, sir. Climate diplomacy, constraints and choices for Bangladesh. In this working session, we have four presentations from four distinguished panelists. First, we have Professor Nizan Ayer Khan, Deputy Director, International Center for Climate Change and Development. Professor Khan shall join us virtually. Then we have Mr. Arif M. Faisal, Program Specialist, Major Climate and Energy, UNDP Bangladesh. We also have Mr. Mirza Shaukot Ali, Director, Climate Change and International Convention, Department of Environment, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. And we also have Dr. Sufia Khanum, Senior Research Fellow, Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies. Their presentations will be followed by an open discussion, a discussion session where all guests are invited to speak. The working session will be chaired by Ambassador Shamshir M. Chaudhry B. Bikram, the former Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman, Bangladesh Institute of Strategic Studies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, and very renowned uh, academics and uh, people who have been involved with climate issues for a very, very long time and continue to do the hard work. Uh, it's my great pleasure to chair this session and I thank the BISS for this. Uh, without any ado, let us go straight to the session. The first speaker in this session is Professor Mizan R. Khan, and his uh, subject of his discussion is Financing for Loss and Damage Concerns for Bangladesh. He's already been introduced by the moderator. I will now call on Dr. Mizan. He'll be joining us virtually, if I, if I am right. So over to you, Dr. Mizan, 
and uh, we would like to listen to your very valuable remarks. Yeah, thank you, Honorable uh, Chair of the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Segupta, for sharing uh, my presentation. Uh, I feel very sorry that my heart lies to my old home, BASS. Well, I had been a research director for years together, but now I'm in Bangkok attending another UNDP session, again on climate finance. So uh, as uh, the chair uh, has mentioned, my topic is about uh, financing loss and damage, Bangladesh perspective. This is my individual perspective, in fact, because I'm not a government official, so uh, I cannot speak on behalf of the government. So next slide, please. So first, I, I have to go a little supersonic because in 15 minutes I have to finish. So I have mentioned, uh, 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 gave some quotations from the latest uh, IPCC report uh, about loss and damage, about financing, about unequal distribution, uh, about what is loss and damage, etc. And also uh, AR6, you know, had made a, a scathing critique of the past adaptation actions. Um, as ineffective and often leading to maladaptation. Um, AR6 also provides evidence that climate justice needs to be at the center of global policymaking, which was not the inaugural uh, speaker. I think our uh, deputy foreign minister has referred to climate justice as uh, I got to hear the last minute. So different estimates suggest but the range varies from uh, 300 to $700 billion. And by 2060, uh, it will sh shoot up to $1.2 trillion. So astronomic figures, but we don't have in reality. So next slide we will speak about. The first about the history of loss and damage a little. Please press the button so that the arrow comes in. Uh, this slide shows you how, starting from 1991, this agenda of loss and damage came into being. Uh, now, back in 1991, EOSIS, uh, Alliance of Small Island Developing Estates, already before adoption of the uh, convention in 92, they have foreseen that those many of those countries will face watery deaths. Uh, based on the first uh, IPCC assessment report, report. So they have started then shouting kind of virtually to look for some com uh, compensation mechanism uh, to cover the loss and damage, but that was not agreed. And then article uh, 4.8 of the convention includes uh, ins uh, insurance kind of as a mechanism to address their claims. But then in Bali, this loss and damage uh, uh, as an agent has been included for discussion. And then in 2013, we have uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism established at COP19 in uh, Warsaw. And then we have uh, in 2015, you know, now the Paris Agreement, Article 8 has got an article on uh, uh, loss and damage, uh, but uh, about financing, not much is there. Even uh, for displacement of uh, the eight actions, displacement uh, has not mentioned as a separate action, but a task force on displacement has been established. Uh, which are doing now some research and operation, not uh, uh, research and understanding, not so much actions per se on the ground. And then we have a kind of COP26 uh, last year, where in Glasgow, uh, the um, uh, UNFCC parties have agreed to have a Glasgow dialogue on loss and damage, which will continue until 2024. So just this is about the historical developments of the uh, loss and damage agenda. So I can mention the during the last three decades of UNFCC negotiations, the first decade was meant for uh, mitigation and uh, convention itself um, ultimate, uh, the uh, main focus was on mitigation and adaptation was kind of an afterthought. But this decade is going to be the decade of loss and damage. Next slide, please. So what are the actions under Article uh, 8 of the Paris Agreement? Loss and damage includes both economic and non-economic loss and damage, which cannot be, for example, loss of lives or loss of uh, sense of place habitation or cultural values, 
So this cannot be economically uh, calculated. Uh, then Article 8.3 mentions about three areas of action, averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage. Averting, uh, next slide will show uh, a little detail about these three action areas. Then averting, I have mentioned, averting can be achieved through mitigation and adaptation. Minimizing can be achieved through enhancing adaptive capacity and addressing loss and damage to support uh, relief, recovery, uh, and uh, rehabilitation, et cetera. But this is the weakest loop in the loss and damage uh, agenda. Uh, the, however, adaptation of loss and damage are conflated because loss and damage is defined as uh, addressing the residual damages, but developed countries uh, you know, conflate adaptation and subsume uh, loss and damage uh, within adaptation, but developing countries we don't take, we take loss and damage clearly as the third policy plank mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. But adaptation finance is extremely poor, as you uh, see in the next slide. Ha, here are three pillars of loss and damage. When, what, and uh, how. I have already mentioned minimize, about averting, minimizing, and addressing. And how can we do that? What are, could be the instruments? So you can go to next slide. Ha. So here, uh, let me uh, talk about a little on adaptation finance, because if adaptation finance would have been extremely ambitious, then loss and damage could have been addressed, but that is not there. We all know the legal and institutional framework of climate finance established long back, but climate finance reflects the political, economic, and social dynamics, uh, dynamics of a neoliberal globalized order where market justice is, uh, uh, prevails. Even if market justice would have applied, could have been applied, then the poor would have been benefited. For example, correcting the market failures through internalization of externalities in the form of polluter based principles is not there. There is no perfect competition, both at global and national level. It is the monopoly and oligopolies which set the price on everything. So the poor become double loser. So even climate justice is not there. No, market justice is not there in the current functioning of the process. Antonio Guterres, in his inaugural address um, of this session, uh, General Smith session, mentioned clearly that the world suffers from a colossal dysfunction, both politically and economically. That is what uh, happens globally. Though rich countries are legally obligated to support developing countries with the language shall provide, but still we are far, far away uh, from uh, the uh, placed figure. We have some, I'm not going to mention those numbers, for example, we have very measly or paltry figures of climate finance, particularly adaptation finance. Here in the next bullet you can see, and there is double, triple counting, but developing countries believe more in Oxfam reports, which deflects down at least three times the claimed figure of delivery by the OECD countries. So uh, we uh, have not uh, at all a satisfactory kind of uh, uh, number. Triple counting, et cetera, happens. Loan uh, grant ratio, even for developing countries, 80, 20% for overall developing countries, but even for the LDCs, we have two thirds of loans for adaptation. And this is something, a double, triple injustice because these uh, low income and LDC countries are falling into a new climate debt trap because you all know that adaptation uh, projects or programs don't bring in immediate uh, results, don't bring in immediate profit or uh, re uh, returns. But still we are um, uh, pushed through uh, loans down our throats. Then climate finance increasing a little, but ODA is getting uh, increasingly repackaged as climate finance. This is again an injustice because the mission of ODA is totally different. It's about the provision of basic development needs, particularly of the poor, but climate finance and ODA is kind of enlightened charity uh, as an instrument of foreign policy tool of development partners, but uh, climate finance is all right and they have uh, agreed uh, as obligatory responsibility, but still we have to accept loans. 
and then only about uh, less than even 10% of adaptation finance goes down to the poor vulnerable communities and women. This is another injustice also. Then access remains as problematic as ever. From Bangladesh or from other LDC countries, if you submit a proposal, it takes at least two to three years uh, to get the ultimate not for funding. So uh, this is uh, extremely painful and uh, exhaust exhausting. I, uh, intentionally, this uh, international bureaucracy has made this process extremely complex. Thank you. Next slide, please. And here, I'm not going to detail out, just uh, you have some instruments, uh, financial protection and recovery and about displacement. And on the right columns, you have what can be done, what are the instruments. So I think Dr. Shegupta, you will um, share these PowerPoints with the audience present today there. So I'm not going to uh, detail out about all those. Next slide, please. So, now let us specifically focus on financing for loss and damage. We know there is still no, no dedicated financing for loss and damage. Uh, Warsaw International Mechanism has failed to mobilize support, which was one of their uh, terms of reference, but they are failing because they are not allowed to uh, uh, involve in uh, support mobilization. COP26, as I mentioned, established a dialogue on loss and damage. Um, uh, but um, that um, uh, we are not sure how will it function. But UNFCC finally, at the insistence of the uh, group of 77, which comprises of 136 developing countries, um, UNFCC finally agreed to include an agenda on loss and damage for the upcoming uh, Sharm El Sheikh COP27. And uh, literature shows for instruments such as risk pooling, uh, cat bonds, insurance, social safety nets, et cetera. But many of these instruments don't fit with the slow onset events like uh, um, sea level rise, which is a, a silent pillar for Bangladesh, or thawing of permafrost or melting of glaciers. Um, uh, and those uh, melted water must flow through our chest as the lowest riparian country. Um, so we are in a very uh, difficult geographical location, uh, but uh, no funding as yet. And um, insurance doesn't cover the slow onset event because their probabilities are known. Insurance only uh, covers the rapid onset events with unknown probabilities. And then there is discussion of solidarity levies uh, on externalities um, or uh, uh, imposing some uh, levies on global public bads, but that is not there. International application of the polytopes principle is not there, though many developing, developed and developing countries apply domestically some kind of uh, uh, carbon pricing in the form of tax or emissions trading. Uh, and then evolving, uh, there is an evolving consensus uh, uh, for a levy on air and maritime uh, transfer bank of fuel, what they call, but still uh, no agreement yet because public treasury cannot uh, be sufficient uh, for uh, particularly adaptation finance, which we always claim to be uh, public. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so we need to have some auto generation mechanisms, what I call this is my expressions auto generation mechanisms, which does not depend on the public treasury because public treasury responds to the political expediency of a country's uh, condition. If Germany has got a devastating flood, then Germany will reduce both its ODA and climate finance. So we need to have some instruments which are independent of those uh, political expediency of development partners. And these instruments are fair, predictable, adequate, and transparent. And introducing climate visa program for the displaced people, uh, because in Bangladesh, we have a serious problem. Many of the um, small island developing states will face water death, you all know. So uh, New Zealand and Australia have uh, uh, allowed even circular migration visas for those uh, Pacific island developing states. And uh, in future, if something uh, happens uh, like that, then from climate vulnerable, uh, uh, vulnerable hotspot families in Bangladesh, for example, we can have uh, visas uh, for able-bodied able young 
um, boys and girls who can be trained under jointly supported institution in Dhaka, and they can be given permanent residency or even on circular migration, they can go. And this is a win-win option for both the host countries as well as the Sanda countries. I saw not a single article in, in the literature uh, which spoke uh, negative of uh, economic migration. Now this is climate migration. So industrial countries can um, comply with their uh, obligatory responsibility a little uh, through uh, accepting some of our climate displaces. We don't call it refugees. Uh, so this is something that we are pressing hard in the negotiations. Also we'll continue at COP27. Next slide, please. Uh, so, and vulnerable countries, you know, which was led by our uh, Honorable Prime Minister until last year, and she is now a leader in the Troika mechanism. And these uh, 20 countries lose their 2 to 3% of their GDP uh, for loss and damage every year um, due to climate change impact. And um, uh, this is uh, CVF countries have taken some initiatives, including establishing their own funds for loss and damage facility and the, uh, their own uh, little insurance facility. And the cost of loss and damage uh, are mostly borne uh, by uh, the households. In Bangladesh, for example, more than $2 billion are spent by households to address the loss and damage in Bangladesh. But we get about, uh, for example, we got only so far $94 million uh, uh, during the last decade uh, from uh, GCF, Green Climate Fund, which is the number one uh, dedicated funding for climate change, uh, 160 million people. So this is kind of a shame that uh, we uh, deal with so little figures. Bangladesh government invests about uh, six to seven percent of the annual GDP for addressing uh, our loss and damage and adaptation. Thank you. Next slide, please. So. Mm, what outside of the UNFCCC, uh, uh, there are also initiatives, for example, Scotland and some other countries, including Denmark, uh, just uh, has announced uh, about two weeks back about uh, close to 14 uh, million euros, and some other international NGOs also are contributing fund, um, but still they lack uh, uh, extremely and fragmentation and complex uh, international architecture. Um, funds and funds everywhere, but we don't find the money. Uh, and uh, there is huge uh, gaps in demand-driven human capacity development for implementation of loss and damage. Next slide, please. I think this is uh, my last slide uh, or the uh, one before last. So what could be done? New and additional funding, because the article 4.3 of the convention clearly mentions about four cardinal principles of climate finance. Uh, adequacy and predictability, new and additional, but uh, we don't find new and additional. ODA is being repackaged, even past ODA commitments are repackaged now as climate finance. And if there is no predictability, then we cannot, adaptation is anticipatory. So we cannot plan for uh, adaptation. Adaptation is not coping, which historically had been done by humankind, uh, but uh, with don't have that. Implementation of key justice criteria, like, the, um, for example, polluter pays principle, uh, but polluter pays principle first to be done in development partner countries. Because if we apply in if Bangladesh, uh, starts applying polluter pays principle, uh, it will be, it may not be poverty sensitive. So we need some years of space. Uh, then common but differentiated responsibility is not uh, uh, still there. Then adequate additionality, adequacy, additionality, predictability is not there. Still. So I'm very frustrated as a climate finance negotiator for the long uh, last 20 years with the Bangladesh delegation. Uh, coverage of the relevant climate uh, related issues, loss and damage, loss uh, uh, and finance, loss financing facility, uh, we need to agree on. And G77 uh, countries is now very strong, and they are one in this demand that we must have a dedicated loss and damage financing facility. And developing and implementing need based. 
um, uh, financing and jointly with, uh, to be uh, managed jointly with the vulnerable countries and also vulnerable population. We need to develop a participatory um, uh, climate finance mechanism uh, because we, we argue as a negotiator that uh, climate finance, even adaptation finance will not flow to the most vulnerable countries. Even if we start drowning uh, in the waves, sea waves, finance will flow to the countries uh, with uh, who are best in fiduciary management. So all developing countries, including Bangladesh, we need to uh, strengthen our fiduciary management system with full accountability and transparency. Okay, and um, so here there is huge gap and support. And learning from Bangladesh, you know, uh, we, Bangladesh is way ahead in terms of disaster management, for example, taken as a uh, role model uh, for the whole world. Next slide. Uh, taken as a role model for the whole world. And this we also need to establish for uh, adaptation. And we can do this if we, Bangladesh government, for example, uh, the um, GCA, Global Center on Adaptation, South Asia Center is established in Dhaka. And now Dhaka has got the uh, global hub on locally led adaptation. So we hope Bangladesh government, already many governments around the world have endorsed the eight principles of the uh, locally led adaptation. Uh, our expectation is that our government also will endorse those uh, eight principles of locally led adaptation, uh, which includes devolution of climate finance management, um, addressing the structural inequalities and all those sectors and principles. Then uh, the proposed national we have kind of, we have our dedicated funding from our own source, BCCT. And then um, about two years back, uh, our government, uh, uh, the PPP office uh, under the Prime Minister Secretariat has initiated kind of a public-private partnership and loss and damage under that. But uh, the former secretary retired and now it is kind of a little going slow. Disaster Management Ministry is taking this up. It may take some uh, time. It's a two-year pilot program. But once we can uh, pilot this and uh, show the success with our own resources initially, then it can be a role model for all other developing countries. So this is what I wanted to share. I had to go supersonic. I will be very happy uh, before the next presentation. I will request the chair if any question comments from the audience, because I have to leave in next 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mizan. I think there are a lot of takeaways from your very instructive, informative paper. And uh, uh, of course, you have also expressed your frustration and the uh, uh, inadequate action and certainly inadequate financing, especially climate financing and the weaknesses of the Paris Agreement and how they have not been effectively implemented. Uh, there is no dedicated financing for loss and damages. Uh, ODA is being uh, kind of downsized and uh, climate financing is made part of overall ODA, which means financing for climate is also getting downsized. You've also listed the way forward. Uh, and uh, one of the things you've said is a, a, a report on the cap of uh, LND financing. And you ended with uh, the message of the lessons that one can learn from Bangladesh. Uh, either it is a leading example uh, as using its own resources to mitigate the suffering and it can be a role model in this context. Now you have requested that uh, the question and answer session in your case may be done at this stage because you're about to give, if that is okay with everybody, uh, I'll open the floor for any question that anybody might like to have from Dr. Mizan at this stage because the others will take the questions at the open uh, discussion session. And Mizan has to leave. So any question for Dr. Mizan, please introduce yourself and then ask the question. Thank you. The floor is open for questions and comments. It seems there is uh, no specific question or comments from the audience. Anybody? Oh, no, we have one. Yes. 
Uh, I'm Mohammad Abu yeah, Yusuf, yeah. Joint Secretary, Minister of Finance. Uh, I just uh, want to thank uh, Dr. Mizan Khan for his excellent very informative presentation. I've got a small query. Uh, is there any definite, uh, is there any decision under UNFCCC that confirms that the $100 billion that developed countries are supposed to contribute for climate cause has to be new and additional. I mean, has to be new and additional on top of the ODA. Is there any decision? Thank you. Under UNFCCC. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the million dollar question. This hundred billion dollar is kind of still remains the golden deal for developing countries. Um, just in 2010, 2009 at Copenhagen, which we call Brokenhagen or Copenhagen, there those hundred billion dollar figure has been raised. But uh, just think of still by 2020, uh, with so ma much inflation during the last decade, still OECD claims uh, their last figure is $83.6 billion uh, uh, provided to developing countries. But as I mentioned, we believe, developing countries believe more in Oxfam reports, you know, not the OECD figures, because the, there is triple uh, and quadruple counting because of the uh, Rio, they work under Rio Marcus and subjective, based on subjective uh, interpretations, the development partners put tick boxes as principal uh, project as climate finance or significant. But that is the, the key to the problem lies that during the last quarter of a century, we could not agree to what climate finance is. No definition still of climate finance, no criteria. That is why any money now is repackaged as climate finance. And uh, uh, for that uh, uh, expert dialogue is going on, three dialogues are, have already happened, but those are not expert dialogues. I uh, had the privilege of attending the SB a session dialogue, which was kind of a bazaar. It was not an expert dialogue. It was a big plenary session, then, then workout groups. So it's whole diplomacy in one of my book published in 19, uh, 2014 uh, by Routledge uh, from London and New York. I have mentioned climate negotiations as kind of a process of active inaction. But still for Bangladesh, climate diplomacy has got great value. Climate diplomacy is the um, uh, number one most and most global public form of global diplomacy, where Bangladesh has kind of an opportunity to brand our country, what we are doing good to project. That is the value I find as a long time negotiator of uh, attending climate negotiations. But those are uh, those figures are misly or very paltry figures. I am not optimistic. Uh, I am quoting a, a kind of uh, a doyen of climate economics, Lord Nicholas Stone, who wrote back in two zero. Six, the climate economics, who served at the World Bank and then um, uh, uh, working at, at the School of uh, London Economics. She mentioned, I'm exactly quoting her, very hard uh, statement he gave, uh, to say that uh, we cannot afford um, climate finance is sheer nonsense. He talked of developed countries. So this is his statement, not mine. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mizan. <clears throat> Any further questions? Yes, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. This is Alauddin Ahmed. I was a member of Bangladesh Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, Professor Khan, uh, he mentioned in one slide that rich countries are legally obligated to support the DCs. So having known that, uh, uh, can we feel, can we not feel more strong and work that way, Professor? Please. Yeah, thank you. Because uh, I'm not a, a student of uh, law, so, but you know, when we have in any agreement, shall provide developed country parties shall provide support, uh, then shall provide men's obligatory responsibility. They have agreed. This is there both in the convention under Article 4.3 and 4.4 .4 of the convention, and also under Article 9.1 of the Paris Agreement. And, should, and then again, 
Article 9.2, for example, in the Paris Agreement says, other country parties which are in a position to do so should support. Should support means recommendatory, not obligatory. So I hope in the audience there are lawyers who can interpret better than I do. So this is what we call obligatory responsibility and under, under article 4.3, there was those four cardinal principles of climate finance, but uh, you know, developed countries don't agree to new and, new and additional climate finance. They mixed it with ODA, but as a non-native English speaker, I can vouch for the interpretation. When we use the word new and additional, it means we have something as base and that base is the ODA but developed countries don't agree to them. In international diplomacy, you know, there's a um, terminology we use, constructed ambiguity. So in the text, uh, there is, for example, Article 11 of the convention uh, mentions about um, this uh, financing subject to availability. That qualifying is there. So, you know, these ambigu ambiguous interpretations give leeway or freedom to the individual countries for interpreting in their own way. And we don't have any sanctioning power in international diplomacy. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please introduce yourself and ask the question. Thank you, Chair. I'm Ashfaq. I work at International Organization for Migration. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I have a couple of issues, but I promise to keep them brief. So these issues, I think, is uh, not only applies to Professor Nizam Al Khan, but also for the other panelists. I'd be grateful if you can also reflect on this. So as we all know that Bangladesh is graduating from the LDC country status to developing country status in 2026, uh, I am curious to know what kind of impact this graduation would have in terms of climate finance. Because I understand that there are some dedicated funds which only applies to LDCs. So if we become a developing country, these funds will no longer be accessible to us. Uh, the second issue, uh, we are, it's great to see the displacement and migration elements in the context of climate change is being acknowledged. Uh, I remember Ambassador Imti has mentioned it uh, Honorable State Minister mentioned it, and Professor Mijan Khan also mentioned it. So how the government of Bangladesh and its diplomatic wing need to position itself to address the cross-border element of displacement and migration in the context of climate change, that would be very interesting to know. So in the world, we have a couple of good practices, I would say, emerging in this context. So if we look back a decade, back in 2010, there is an earthquake in Haiti. And the people in Haiti were given kind of a temporary protection status in the United States. So they were allowed to go to United States, work for there for 18 months, and they had to go back to Haiti after that. So such kind of mechanism allows to build resilience of the people who are vulnerable to climate change and disasters. We have similar examples from the uh, Pacific small island states like Kiribati, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. They also enjoy kind of facilitated travel movements to Australia, New Zealand, and other countries. So also at Africa, we, and also in Latin America, we kind of see more liberal movement across borders, irrespective of the reason uh, of the movement. And we all know that South Asia till now has been one of the least integrated region of the country. So how the diplomacy can facilitate uh, a freer movement in the context of disaster and climate change within South Asia. I think that uh, could be a part, part of uh, climate diplomacy. Uh, as my last point, I'd like to say that recently Denmark has been, I think they're the first country to offer loss and damage compensation or loss and damage finance, the most uh, $13 million, if I remember correctly, most of the uh, money is going to Africa and the Sahel region. So how the diplomats of the Bangladesh can also engage in brokering such funding, that is also, that would be also good to uh, see. Thank you for giving me the floor. Mr. Bizar would like to comment on that? Yes, sure. Then let, uh, let me come in first about uh, impacts of our graduation. Certainly we'll have impacts, but in terms of climate finance, uh, let me focus on 
once we graduate, we will be having, in terms of CODIA, we will be having less and less of grants, and we have to accept that. But even graduation should not inhibit our getting uh, grants uh, as adaptation finance. But there we need to build capacity. As I mentioned, about two thirds of uh, adaptation finance comes as loans to these low income LDC countries. This is a double, triple injustice. You know, we are getting into a um, uh, new climate debt trap because adaptation finance, as I mentioned, does not bring in immediate uh, benefits uh, like mitigation, for example, can be sold and bought in the market. Uh, so this is so we need to build capacity for our developing proposals uh, and we need to develop technical skills both within the government ministries as well as uh, outside as also we need to another very significant element of proposal development is having excellent language skills because proposal development is kind of a playing uh, with words what you put as output impact outcome etc so we need also so um, to develop a core proposal development experts. This is my suggestion. And uh, the second about displacement. Yes, Bangladesh government has already, because this is our prime uh, uh, issue in terms of climate impacts. And our prime minister herself is very, very eloquent and loud about uh, this climate displacement. Um, uh, we have adopted already uh, inaugural adaptation, adoption was the uh, Glasgow summit. Uh, we uh, have a policy on uh, climate displacement, disaster and climate displacement. And there are some good actions, for example, mentioned in that strategy, like uh, skill development training in vulnerable hotspot areas, the government will establish um, training institutions for capacity building, which can be trained, and then they can cater to the needs of uh, Bangladesh uh, to address uh, um, climate impacts for adapt to enhance adaptive capacity, as well as that manpower can be exported. In the uh, science magazine published in 18th of June last year, we have published, I'm the lead author, we have published uh, a policy piece uh, about 3,000 words, so you can get it if you Google my name, for example. And science is a very uh, impact, uh, high impact journal with 43 uh, three, uh, impact factor. There, we have mentioned about two uh, suggestions. One is uh, establishing climate resilient migrant friendly towns because all our climate displaces, we don't call refuges, where climate displaces move to Dhaka in search of jobs. So livelihoods is their prime concern. So if our secondary cities, for example, a smaller towns and cities where government investments are now happening, there if we can turn those uh, towns into climate and resilient migrant friendly with better education opportunities for their children and like that, that is one option. Another option I have suggested for selective relocation abroad, not wholesale immigration, selective relocation abroad, meaning that if we can select uh, families from vulnerable hotspot areas in Bangladesh, then one or two young boy or girl, girl can be selected and they can undergo training in Dhaka, in Bangladesh, uh, uh, in jointly supported uh, state-of-the-art training institutions where based on the projected demands of developed countries for the next 15 years, what the demands are, and they will need young and able-bodied labor force for as a maintaining agility of their labor markets because their people are aging and then they are having negative population growth rate. So whatever political rhetorics are there, they will need young and able-bodied uh, skilled uh, labor force. So once we can prepare these uh, critical mass of uh, skilled labor based on their specified demands, then they can go either on the permanent residency or the questioner has mentioned about circular migration. Many countries, including uh, Spain, for example, has got this circular migration with some uh, Latin American countries. Even after super uh, typhoon Haiyan, Canada and America have uh, provided you know, visa to the relatives of those victims who are already settled there. 
Germany has got agreements with Philippines for supplying of uh, nurse, for example, nurses. So we have to have ways. The EU development partner countries are not providing adequate financial support. So assume some responsibility in the sense of taking some trained um, labor force from our countries. Thank you very much. Uh, is there Sorry, any... I have to move, Honorable Chair. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mizan, for your very valuable comment and your responses to the questions. I'll only say this, that uh, <clears throat> we are saying that politics in many of the developed countries, and the recent one is Italy, is centered on the issue of migration itself. It's, it's all, almost like a hostility toward migration because they, they always overlap uh, political, economic migration with climate migration. So I think it's a tough task for all of us, however much we may say. It reminds me of the infamous Attila the Hun. We all know him as not the good man. But he said a very famous word. He said, what is the promise? He said, air containing few words spoken only to be broken. And that is what is exactly happening in global climate economy. Dr. Khan, thank you so very much. I now go on, now go on to the next speaker, uh, Arif M. Faisal. The, his topic is the role of international organization in climate diplomacy. Now, as uh, Arif, I hope you'll take note, one of the things that Dr. Han has said is fragmented architecture. And I think he added the le weak legal architecture in enforcing any decision. Over to you, Asif. You have the floor. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, session Chair Ambassador Shamsur Mobin Choudhury. Uh, we have uh, Ambassador Kaji Imtia Susan, Chairman of BIS, uh, and the Colonel M.S. Sadi. We have other distinguished experts, renowned uh, climate change expert, Professor Salimul Haq, Atik Rahman, and we had also the Chief Guest, uh, Dr. Shamsul Alam, Honorable Ministry, Minister of State, uh, Ministry of Planning. Uh, so I will discuss about the role of uh, international organization in climate diplomacy and also discuss our what is the choice and constraints for Bangladesh because we had actually implemented a project with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, last year and we have some uh, experience during and, and lesson during implementation of this project. So uh, is, a, is, a, is a, what is the country context on climate diplomacy? So Climate change is an impact and valuability is a huge, particularly critical uh, development concern for Bangladesh. And government has already a range of national and legal policy response to do, deal with the impact of climate change and promote climate resilient development and green growth. And climate change presence actually uh, uh, is a new forms of economic growth and development. Because if you consider about the foreign direct investment, and other green types of development, uh, we need to attract actually the foreign direct investment, particularly to promote green development. So green is a new form of currency. And climate negotiation could be an effective platform for branding Bangladesh, because in, in, in inaugural session, uh, our uh, Honorable State Minister and Professor Salimullah clearly mentioned about this, that we have lots of things we can sell, particularly if you consider the locally led adaptation. We have uh, more than five millions of solar home system and, and, and lots of things we are actually promoting now. And now our, we are also working with the uh, particularly refrigeration and air conditioning company, which are the uh, emitting industry and transforming their production system with inclusion of a new technology and, 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 and safe gases. So uh, Bangladesh already branding this thing and climate change is one of the uh, uh, agenda that we can promote this thing. And climate change in human and national security issue are getting intertwined and being recognized as globally. And climate finance is top issue for most vulnerable nations. But if you see the, uh, the Professor Mijan's presentation, loss and damage, cool phase out, energy transition, uh, climate migration and, and, and zero emission, although we do not have uh, net zero emission policy or plan, but if, if you consider the COP26, the main discussion was actually 
concentrate towards the uh, promoting the net zero emission. And capacity building and concessional finance could be the new forums for climate negotiation. And climate negotiation is very complex and multilateral process, and hence no country actually negotiate in UNFCC as a single country, but rather within the negotiation groups. If you uh, ask a climate negotiator like uh, uh, Shokut Mirza, he is participating for climate negotiation for a long time as a part of core member of climate negotiation. If you ask him, what is the Bangladesh achievement on COP26 or upcoming COP27, then he cannot actually properly answer because this is a, is, is, is a global process and more than 195 countries actually participate in negotiation process. Second thing is that uh, traditional instrument of diplomacy are not always effective in acting global climate change. So in order to address climate change challenge, it requires actually new thinking in foreign policy. So how many diplomat, uh, economic counselor, ambassador actually know about this new sets of uh, skills? So we need to develop new sets of uh, skills in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in across the economic counselor and the diplomat. So uh, the foreign policy has stand in two pillars. Uh, nationally, mainly the security and development. So climate change, climate resilient development, because earlier uh, a speaker already mentioned that um, we are no more actually the vulnerable country and vulnerability is no more a saving point. That is why the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan is becoming vulnerable to resilience to prosperity. So this is one of the selling points. And nowadays uh, we are actually, uh, our technology, our locally led adaptation action is actually piloting in African countries, piloting in Central Asian countries. Even our experts are nowadays working in many countries. Recently, uh, many of my colleagues is actually supporting in, in, in many countries across the globe, particularly to, for promoting climate change resilient development. And Bangladesh should consider appointing a personal a special climate change envoy advisor because uh, Salimul Haq and many others actually advocating this for a long time. And Bangladesh is a member of important bodies set up by the UNFCC and such as, you know, we, we are the uh, Adaptation Fund Board Chair, our former Secretary, Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change Board Chair, and the GCF Board and Executive Committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism of Loss and Damage. So this is, uh, I think, another recognition that uh, Bangladesh expertise and importance in this area by the other countries. Uh, so this is just a history of uh, international uh, treaties, convention, and protocol. I would not like to repeat uh, all of those things, but some of this important thing like Rio Convention, IPCC was formed by United Nations Environment Program, World Meteorological Organization, and the Kyoto Protocol, you know, it was a kind of reduction of the greenhouse gas emission protocol is, is, is the first binding mechanism for reduction of the emission. And the Rio Plus 10, UNFCC, particularly the Bali Action Plan, uh, that's actually discussed the five building blocks of climate change, climate change adaptation, mitigation, capacity building, technology development and transfer and the climate finance. And Paris Climate Agreement, this is one of the most uh, recent treaty, you know all about this thing. So what is the role of international uh, organization, particularly UN and other international organization? There, is, there are lots of uh, uh, multilateral international financial institutions like World Bank and Regional Development Bank. And also currently there is a dedicated climate finance window, which is managed by the vertical fund like Green Climate Fund, uh, Global Environment Facility Adaptation Fund, uh, Climate Investment Fund. So they are also playing good role in shaping the climate change negotiation process. So if you see the international convention treaties and protocol, so that are actually framed using very democratic, right-based multilateral process and consensus-based approach because all the climate negotiation process is always actually the consensus-based approach. And that is UN is also playing a very unified role because UN main uh, role is 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 actually the convening role. They are bringing all parties. Parties means countries to make them 
to raise their voice and to make a consensus this decision making process using a very unified single platform and they also support mobilized resource and channel fund because for the most vulnerable country through multilateral funding process green climate fund global environment facility adaptation fund climate investment fund all these fund have their unified policy due diligence process and that's also discussed in the conference of parties because there is whenever you participate in climate change finance discussion that all discuss about these types of vertical fund modality policy and they also review in the cop uh, establish a series of mechanism network and committee for example un also support for mechanism for example warsaw international mechanism or network like santiago network for loss and damage and also the committee uh, for and also they bring the scientific community to, to deal with the climate change like ipcc they prepared a, a report for adaptation mitigation working group report uh, and a strengthen voice and capacity of most vulnerable countries like here is a climate vulnerable forum here is a, a vulnerable 20 countries uh, ldc voice bangladesh is also part of ldc <clears throat> here is also seats a small island developing states uh, they are actually um, support all the vulnerable countries irrespective of their economic status to bring uh, vulnerable voice in single platform and also the track progress in adaptation because in the Paris climate agreement there is a mention about global goal of adaptation for tracking the mitigation every developing country developed country irrespective of their economic status now preparing the nationally determined plan which is a kind of mitigation plan and uh, technology development and transfer. There is also climate finance and capacity building, a Paris Committee on Capacity Building. So they actually, UN body, track the progress of achievement in climate change areas and set target for mitigation, adaptation, and the climate finance. Because uh, in, in, in 2009, there was also a set a floor for $100 billion for climate, but is still the pledge is not met yet and make a delicate balance of power structure because in party there is a poor country vulnerable country developed country uh, middle income country so they make a common negotiation and bargaining platform for all developing parties and engage multiple actors both state and non-state actors so there is a two types of negotiation process uh, those who actually send the government delegation they got the blue badge and there is other people particularly all private sector ngos civil society uh, media they got green badge so they do not have access to the green zone so blue zone where a uh, leader summit or head of the states actually discuss or make talk uh, and also uh, they engage multiple actors to make uh, the negotiation process is following the whole of government and the whole of society approach. And they also support actually engage and empower a special group like youth. Actually, if you consider the COP26, there was a huge engagement of youth and the women. And there is also a big forum of indigenous people, uh, particularly they actually steer the negotiation process. Sometimes they also influence the negotiation. And this is the, uh, uh, in a nutshell about the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, long-term temperature goal. There is a peaking of climate neutrality. There is mitigation that discussed in Article 4, uh, mainly the market-based approach, non-market-based approach, and cooperative approach. Uh, so I would not like to discuss in detail about this thing. Uh, what is the better choice for this thing, climate negotiation? is actually one of the forum to brand Bangladesh through climate diplomacy. So we have already engaged Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Economic Counselor in attracting foreign direct investment and promoting green trade. So, and Bangladesh, you know, uh, is a, one of the country, we have more than 10 green certified garments industries. And if you 
see Bangladesh is uh, among top 10 green industry. We have six uh, green industries in Bangladesh. So our private sector is much aware about this thing. And Bangladesh can be the global lab for climate solution because uh, Professor Salimul Hawk already mentioned that through South-South cooperation, uh, North-South cooperation, and even triangular cooperation, we can actually promote our uh, good locally led adaptation. Uh, invest in developing a national mechanism to tackle loss and damage. We can actually invest. Bangladesh is actually uh, taking lead and bringing other vulnerable nations, particularly in loss and damage agenda. And Bangladesh also could lead to bring international attention in climate displaced person. Uh, my IOM colleague rightly mentioned that he also suggested lots of things. And Professor Mizan has also proposed some of these things like uh, we can open a climate visa or something like this or relocate some people. Uh, so we can lead equally international discussion in this area. And we need to represent balanced climate negotiation team. In earlier time, actually, only Ministry of Environment, Forest, and uh, Climate Change actually lead the climate negotiation team. But this is very good sign that nowadays uh, the present uh, government, actually the Ministry of Environment, Forest Secretary, who actually lead the chair as a climate negotiation team, he bring other relevant ministry like Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, local government, rural development, Ministry of uh, Industry, Ministry of Energy. Uh, Ministry of Women and Children Affairs. So now the climate negotiation team is very balanced. And this is the way how we can advance the negotiation agenda. And we need actually the long term and transformational capacity building because the negotiative team is becoming aging. We need actually new, new generation of negotiators. Uh, and uh, there should be a lead and co implementing agency. And we also need to engage the private sector. Uh, in earlier time, if you compare the 10 years back, there was very few private sector engagement in the whole negotiation process, but that's are in increasing. But we need to increase more private sector, particularly to attract the foreign direct investment to promote the green business. And youth engagement, uh, there is a youth forum in Bangladesh. They are also very much vocal. We need to bring more youth in this uh, negotiation process. And I think there should be a selection criteria for climate negotiation to eliminate uh, the tourists from the outset. And we also need to retain most talented and experienced negotiators because we have observed that uh, there is uh, some of the retired person who have actually huge skills and experience. So we need to retain those negotiators. And we also need to build the capacity of the next generation. So there is a lots of challenge. What is the challenge? So we still need to engage resource, particularly to make a science-based policy making process because climate change is science-based policy making. We need to robust our database for making an evidence-based climate diplomacy and negotiation. And we need to prioritize many commonalities that climate change share with other major foreign policy issues. Because if you consider, we have discussed mainly in our foreign policy uh, development and security. So in development fund, we can further augment this foreign policy by inclusion of this climate resilient development and green growth. Common but differentiated responsibility of countries and, and their respective capabilities is a CBDR, is a principles of UNFCC. This means that there is a common policy. For example, reduction of the emission and enhance of the uh, resilience is the common, but responsibility may be different. The reduction of the emission by China and reduction by emission by Bangladesh is not the same. And therefore, there is a meaningful address equity and climate justice. There is a huge challenge. And Dr. Mizan already discussed about some of the points on this thing. Aesthetic attribution of responsibility are unfair as country situations change. Because, you know, after UK and Russian war, lots of country is becoming vulnerable. And instead of graduating, their economic position is declining due to inflation and lots of things. So. 
Uh, this is another challenge of area in the climate negotiation process. Effective climate risk management calls for national change with a broad and profound impact on local economics and voter lives. Climate agreements are politically controversial as they require explicit local government decision for reforms, often in line with the political economy. Because uh, we have prepared the National Climate Change Adaptation Plan, in parallel, we are now also preparing the local adaptation plan. Because local development is an issue, and that is somehow uh, is a challenging if we do not able to equally address the local level climate change vulnerability. And large economies such as USA, China, India, and Brazil are allowed to grow. The effectiveness of mitigation action elsewhere may be reduced because every country, irrespective of developing development status, have right to grow. So what is the limit of the group? So there is a lots of challenge on this area. Uncertainty about technology, because technology is rapidly changing, particularly if you consider the uh, battery, mainly the lithium ion battery. In COP26, actually all automobile company like you know Toyota, Jaguar, Volvo, they make a pledge that by 2030, all the cars, Will be the electric vehicle by 2030 and we have entered this era so that there is also lots of certainty so if that new technology come then old technology become obsolete and there is an economic impact so choice is in, in, in the country so there is a huge challenge on this thing and the climate negotiation process there is a powerful asymmetries around the negotiation table this is a discussion between poor and developed countries like this. And let's focus on building the next generation of climate diplomacy. I think this should be the main agenda Bangladesh can advance. We need to target our youth, young generation because climate negotiation process is very tiring process. Sometimes the negotiation decision taken in midnight. So you need to be a physically fit and a strong physically. So, uh, I'd like to stop here now. If you have any question or any comments, feedback, we can discuss. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Arif Faisal. I think we'll take the question and answer after all the speakers have spoken. A uh, couple of takeaways from what uh, Arif Faisal have said and the role of international organizations and uh, how do we brand Bangladesh as a climate change fighter. Uh, he also highlighted that the negotiations uh, process are complex in some substance and in form. So don't uh, put up uh, new challenges for us. He has highlighted the importance of capacity building, which I think is very, very important. The need for having special envoys on uh, climate uh, to engage the international community to move forward on uh, mitigating the sufferings and, and the loss and damage. And he has also hinted at public diplomacy when he said non-state actors in the area of uh, climate negotiation and climate diplomacy. I think it's a very important point. Empowering special groups and the need for strengthening uh, climate diplomacy with the right uh, human resources. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Faisal, for your comments. I will now give the floor to uh, Mirza Shaukat Ali. The, his issue is a major outcome of COP26 uh, and issues of COP27, Bangladesh perspective. Over to you, uh, Mr. Shokadali. Thank you, sir. Asalaamu Alaikum. Respected session chair, Ambassador Shamsul Mobin Choudhury, former foreign secretary, respected Ambassador Kazi Imtiaz Hussain, Chairman Bees, Colonel, Colonel uh, MS Sadi, Acting Director General Bees, Professor Salimul Haq, Mr. Atik Rahman, um, respected guests, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, 
before I start my presentation, I just want to uh, mention one, uh, share one information. We had an assessment, what will be the impact on, on our economy after the graduation? So in response to Ms. Ashma's question, I just want to mention that over the uh, last 10, about 10 years, we have accessed only like um, 35 million US dollars from LDC fund. Uh, from GCF, we have accessed 101 million in grant and 250 million in a loan. Uh, and also from adaptation fund, uh, we have accessed like 9.21 million. And from GIF, we have accessed around 166 million US dollar. So total, it stands like 400 or 450 million dollar or so. But from BCCTF, uh, Climate Change Trust Fund, we have already accessed 480 million. And you know, according to the climate fiscal framework, government has allocated about 2.9, uh, 2.96 billion or about 25,000 crore taka uh, for climate related allocations. So, uh, according to our understanding, the, the, there will be no significant, uh, I mean, pressure on our economy in terms of climate finance. And uh, uh, if we take into consideration, we will not be able to access only LDC fund, other than uh, that, we will be able to access uh, adaptation fund as, at, the, at the same time, green climate fund. So, there will be no uh, measure in tax. Having said that, let me um, um, start my presentation. So, I shall I shall be uh, I shall try to be brief because uh, time we are we are very late uh, in terms of time management. So, I'll just share a few slides on outcomes of COP26, and then uh, I will discuss a little bit on global goal on adaptation. And there are a long list of uh, climate finance um, uh, agenda item this time. A long term climate finance, new collective quantified goal. There are uh, black uh, colors. These are annual reports, so I'll not uh, touch on those. And then at the, la uh, at, uh, at the end, I shall uh, talk about global stock take. Uh, this is another important agenda. So, if we take into consideration uh, that uh, what were the major outcomes of COP26? So, on adaptation, you know, uh, we, uh, we have like seven point in paragraph 7.1, it is already mentioned that there is a global goal on adaptation. We have already set, uh, set a global goal on adaptation, but there is no discussion on that. So uh, during last COP26, uh, we uh, established a, a platform which we call um, a two-year Glasgow Summer Shakeboard Program on Global Goal on Adaptation. So the basic understand that uh, through consultation, uh, there will be global goal on adaptation. So we'll, we have already started the work. On adaptation finance, uh, we, we are discussing that uh, already um, uh, Dr. Mizan Khan and other colleagues have mentioned there is a imbalance between adaptation and mitigation. So we were interested to see how this balance can be set. So there were uh, a discussion in uh, Glasgow uh, Pact. Uh, there, there was reference like Norsic concern that the current provision of climate finance for adaptation remains insufficient. And um, I would say that uh, it was possible only because this COP was um, organized in, uh, in, in a developed country. So as the uh, UK was the presidency, they uh, succeeded in uh, pinpointing these issues. Uh, if, I, if I mention another uh, one, one that notes with deep regret, this kind of, kinds of word was never seen in earlier climate change negotiation. This was possible because UK was the president. If it was in a developing country, we would not succeed in utilizing this kind of, um, I mean, uh, languages. So uh, uh, I go. I go, go back. Like urges developed country parties to urgently and significantly scale up their provision of climate finance. So these were the outcomes uh, in adaptation finance. In long term finance, you know, we, the discussion of long term finance has started uh, long back in uh, COP seventeen, um, uh, and but uh, uh, that uh, lingered, and then we uh, took decision that this uh, this decision will. Uh, this discussion will continue, uh, continue till 2027. 20, uh, and, uh, uh, and the discussion, like those with deep regret that development parties to mobilize 100 billion dollars per year has not yet been met. So, this already um, discussed by Professor Mizana, 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 Mizana Khan. So, I'm not going to discuss about this. Uh, and uh, you know, there is ambiguity because ODA and climate finance, and to our understanding, climate finance should be. New addition of that never happened, uh, and it, that was uh, ambiguous. That was not very clear. So calls upon developed country parties to provide greater clarity on their pledges. 
and there is concrete discussion a decision that a biennially developed country uh, should um, uh, submit uh, their their i mean information about their climate finance uh, financial support to developing countries uh, a road back for deliberations of new collective quantified financial goals so this was another important uh, initiative that was taken and um, uh, an ad hoc work program for 2022 and 2024 was uh, agreed and there will be four technical workshop expert dialogue per year and high level ministerial dialogue will happen um, uh, 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 like um, in 2022, 24 and 26 to come up with a um, uh, climate finance decision at, uh, at 2027. In mitigation, that was one of the most important agenda item uh, to keep the temperature one goal 1.5 degree alive. We know there are two uh, temperature goals uh, fixed in the uh, Paris Agreement. One is two degrees Celsius, but our preferred one from developing countries and LDC countries is, if possible, it should be 1.5 degrees Celsius. So in that line, uh, uh, there were some uh, outcomes like this results to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And you know, uh, to achieve that, uh, reducing global carbon emission by 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050 is, is a necessity. Uh, but um, to, uh, to our, um, uh, according to the assessment report, uh, that is not going to happen. That will be very difficult if we don't um, uh, um, make our indices nationally determined contribution ambitious. So um, according to the present status of the indices, the temperature rise will be beyond three degrees Celsius. But uh, if we want to contain that, we have to increase this ambition further. So in every five year cycle, when we submit them indices, we need to make it more ambitious. And we have already established a work program to address climate mitigation ambition and implementation. So that activity is also ongoing. Loss and damage, we, we know, um, we have already discussed, so I, I'm going to um, skip this slide. Uh, now I want to focus on my uh, presentation on some selected, very selected um, agenda items of COP27. So as I have already mentioned that Sharma Sheikh work program on uh, GDA, that is the most important one, the most important issues for this COP. So I want to mention some of the backgrounds. So CMS3 established and launched a comprehensive two-year Glasgow Sharma Sheikh work program on global global adaptation. So this will be carried out by SUBSTA subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice and the subsidiary body for implementation. So these are the two bodies, subsidiary bodies that, that is jointly uh, working on this. And the modality is that there will be four workshops per year. So two virtual workshops and two uh, workshops in conjunction with SB sessions. So one, one uh, uh, physical workshop was done in uh, June in uh, Bonn and there'll be another session in uh, during this summer uh, work program. And the third virtual session will be uh, organized on 17th of this month. Uh, hopefully we shall attend in that uh, program. And uh, the secretary will uh, prepare under the guidance of the SB chair an annual report of the, on the workshop. And um, uh, that, uh, that will uh, actually lead to the next, next year's activities. So our um, um, position uh, to some extent, our uh, our national position to some extent, all LDC or developing countries position is that um, the global con adaptation is yet to be determined because the lack of global commitments, capacity gaps and in adaptation plans and huge deficiency in climate finance. That is the main challenge because the commitment from the developed countries and even larger developing countries was not adequate to come up with a global con adaptation.
So um, on long-term climate finance, COP26 decided that the continued discussion on long-term climate will continue uh, and conclude in uh, 2027. So as I mentioned, it has started in COP17 uh, uh, and uh, in 19 it was concluded and then decided that from 20, uh, COP20 onward, this, this will continue until 2027. COP20 has also requested the Standing Committee and Finance to prepare a report in 2022 on progress towards achieving the goal of mobilizing grand US dollar 100 billion per year to address the needs of developing countries. And um, there is also a decision that um, yeah, there will be uh, high level ministerial dialogues in 2022, 24, and 26. And then uh, in 2027, we shall come up with a decision. Requested the COP presidency to summarize the deliberations of the dialogue for consideration by the COP in that year thereafter. That means every year there'll be some, some sort of reporting and then uh, next year there'll be uh, some sort of discussion. And interestingly, the term climate finance, uh, that, that definition is not uh, established yet. So we are willing that um, a standing committee on finance by this year uh, establish the definition of climate finance that will clarify many things. And uh, this is very important that uh, Article 4.9.4, 9 9.5, and 9.7, 9 we know Article 9 is for climate finance. So these, there are a specific reference of like um, biennial reporting by the developed countries. There is a, a balance about climate finance between adaptation and mitigation and support mobilized for de develop, developing countries. Those are mentioned in this, in this, um, in, in this uh, articles. So, that should be um, uh, addressed. That is that is our uh, understanding. And uh, as mentioned, uh, adaptation uh, finance is less prioritized uh, compared to the mitigation finance. Uh, so we want to ensure that there is a balance and adaptation is uh, gets its um, uh, importance. Adaptation finance should be prioritized for achieving climate resilience in climate vulnerable countries. For us, well, that is very important. So uh, uh, in long-term finance, we have another, another point that it is vital the developed countries give clear indications of how they will step up their funding to meet the US dollar $100 billion. As Dr. Um, Mizar Khan has mentioned, um, uh, there was a uh, mention that 83 billion, 83.6 billion was mobilized by, um, by developed countries and uh, OECD has, has this reporting, but there are different estimations. And according to, to those reporting, around 20% was mobilized for uh, adaptation and uh, that is a huge imbalance. Uh, so we wanted to um, make sure and also the channel of disbursing the resources is, is very uh, not very clear. Uh, we can see only those that is challenged from Green Plant Fund, LDC Fund, Adaptation Fund, but there are other market mechanisms, uh, uh, bilateral mechanism, uh, so which the channelization of these resources um, we did not actually really track or assess. That's why we are interested that this uh, mobilization or uh, this um, uh, disbursement of the resources is very important. And there should be some sort of mechanism uh, so that we can track these uh, financial flows. In case of new collective uh, quantified goal on climate finance, you know, in COP21, uh, there is a decision in, under uh, Article 9, Paragraph 3 that. Um, Paris Agreement, uh, developed countries intend to continue the existing collective mobilization goal through 2025. So it was 100 billion in 2020, uh, but uh, prior to 2025, the CMA shall set a new collective quantified goal. And already there is discussion. So from 100 billion dollars, that will be raised because the requirement of adaptation and mitigation is much higher. And according to some assessment, like there is, there is a requirement of 600 billion dollars. There is some assessment that it will be like 300 plus billion dollar per year uh, by, by the developing countries. So there is already a discussion has started, and under this NCQ QQ, um, Z, uh, three workshops actually uh, was conducted, and there was a decision that four technical expert dialogue uh, on this work program will be held each year, and three uh, already uh, organized. The first dialogue was in South Africa from 24 to 25 March in Cape Town. Second was in uh, Bonn. And uh, I was uh, present in the second and third uh, consultation in Malida. So, um, but unfortunately, the main focus was a mobilization of climate finance through private sector participation. But we know for adaptation, private sector participation um, for adaptation is uh, insignificant. And 
also there are challenges that are very uh, and there are huge challenges because driver system looks for um, and profit maximization and in case of adaptation it could be like voluntary contribution kind of thing and um, there is possibility of uh, uh, a little uh, um, support uh, from the um, uh, private sector for adaptation activity for mitigation it is uh, is uh, quite okay because uh, most of in most of the cases the technology lies with the private sector and there are opportunities but in case of adaptation these are the challenge but to, the discussion was um, Mr. Mizan also mentioned the discussion focused on private sector involvement in adaptation and and there are different kinds of um, um, examples from different countries and it seemed the focus uh, was mainly probabilizing private students for adaptation and that is not to our um, uh, I mean um, uh, benefit uh, it seems from the negotiation and we try to focus that uh, our um, uh, requirement is that private public finance should be the main stay of uh, these um, uh, climate finance and uh, there were some reports for um, for this new collective quantified goal uh, discussion uh, which was prepared by the standing committee on finance they said there is a huge lack of uh, um, i mean gaps uh, of climate financial requirement or needs uh, of developing countries from the existing um, ndcs and also naps uh, but uh, we we mentioned that there are ndcs naps national communication biennial update reports and in the future um, uh, we are going to have a biennial transparency report there is also uh, technology needs assessment uh, report. So there are some sort of indication what amount of resources that will be required for the climate finance in the future. So uh, let's start with that figure and then we can come up with a corrected figure or better estimation um, uh, for climate finance. So uh, this may I, may I, I think we are already over short the time. So yes, sir, I, I know. Uh, thank you. So uh, I, I think I, I, will, I will finish within, uh, I have three, uh, four slides more. So um, I, I already mentioned that uh, it was focused mainly heavily on private sector. Uh, and we mentioned that new collective quantified goal should have a review and adjustment cycle because every five year we will uh, be uh, like uh, NDC submission and also there will be global stock test. So we review the process um, uh, uh, every five year and then readjust our requirements. So this is the uh, my last uh, agenda item, matters related to global stock take. We know, um, uh, uh, after the Paris Agreement, there is the article in the Paris Agreement. There is the Article 14 uh, and Paragraph 2, where we have actually mentioned there is a, a global stock take that will be uh, initiated every uh, five years. But the first um, stock take will be in 2023, and thereafter every five years. So that is that was the decision, and um, we are going to have this stock take uh, next year, and uh, any uh, and discussion for this stock take has already started. You can see uh, from 50. Uh, SB 52 and um, uh, we have started the uh, discussion. So, and there will be a, uh, like four synthesis report, a synthesis report on the state of greenhouse gas emission, a synthesis report on the state of adaptation efforts, a synthesis report on overall effects of the uh, of parties, indices and overall progress, and a synthesis report on the financial flows. So based on these uh, four synthesis reports and discussions, we will come up with a um, uh, decision uh, on global stock take. So um, uh, this uh, stock take is ongoing, and uh, we hope that um, we shall be able to come up with a more ambitious NDCs and also mobilizing more finance for adaptation activities uh, through this global stock take. So with that, I uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shokatali, for your very valuable comments, uh, three brief takeaways. You have tried to draw uh, the passage from Glasgow to Sharm el Sheikh, and let's see how much we can move forward after Sharm el Sheikh. It uh, doesn't look very optimistic right now, but let's hope for the best anyway. Uh, commitments are not being made, even the $100 billion still remain the billion dollar question. Uh, mitigation goals, of course, are still short, and let's see, uh, we have to wait until the end of Sharm el Sheikh to see how we progress. Next speaker is Dr. Supiya Khanam. Uh, she has slightly ch changed the topic of her paper. Uh, she's going to talk on Bangladesh's Presidency in Climate Vulnerable Forum, CVF, an assessment of climate leadership in perspective. Now, Supiya has the disadvantage of being the last speaker after the time has already been overshot, so I don't need to 
reminder of the uh, importance of being big. Floor is open for you. Thank you, sir. Um, um, uh, honorable uh, fellow uh, panelists, uh, distinguished uh, participants, I'm very much uh, honored and delighted to present my paper in front of this August gathering of renowned climate scientists and activists whom I personally know and um, follow them in a different uh, knowledge sharing platform. So I am taking this opportunity to uh, speaking in front of them. And uh, my previous uh, presenters actually present paper from their own experiences and which is more life practical, but my paper will be quite theoretical. So I made my slide quite colorful and as a last presenter so that the audience <laughs> will be aware and um, listen my presentation. And I'm looking forward, of course, your valuable comments and observation because this is a developing paper. The title of my presentation is Bangladesh's Presidency in Climate Vulnerable Forum, an Assessment of Climate Leadership in Perspective. So with this uh, uh, title, the, uh, my presentation will follow the first section, background, and then the conceptual framework of leadership, and then assessment of the Bangladesh leadership, that how Bangladesh has taken the initiatives and the um, uh, or the policies to um, uh, to hold its leadership in the in climate negotiation or in climate regimes and the leadership of legitimacy as we are claiming that we are the leaders but how much it is um, it is um, actually um, legitimate or um, uh, actually uh, value ourselves and how others are actually seen as a leader and finally I will conclude my presentation with some of the challenges. So why I have taken CVF and why I have changed the title of my presentation, you have already uh, get an idea that uh, why CVF is very much important for the upcoming climate diplomacy of Bangladesh. And in this perspective, actually, uh, it consists of 55 countries where actually 1.4 billion people live, but they actually contribute the, uh, in the greenhouse gas only the 5%. And uh, they have to pay about 2.4 trillion um, uh, GDP every year due to the extreme um, uh, uh, climatic events. So if you see this graph, you will understand that why the membership of CVF is growing so fast. If you see the member countries of CVF in Africa and Middle Eastern country, it is 25 countries has already joined. Uh, if you see the blue, deep blue colors, they are the members of the CVF countries and the light blue colors are actually the observer status. In Asia and the Pacific, 19 countries and in Latin America and Caribbean, already 11 countries have joined in this uh, political block. So these are the evolution of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. So if you see, it started in 2009, so the first CVF meeting, and in 2010, Kiribati was the president of CVF Forum, CVF, and Bangladesh first time led CVF in 2011. In 2013, Costa Rica actually uh, take the presidency and in 2015, Philippines. And then again, um, in 2016, Ethiopia, and Marshall Island in 2018. Bangladesh second time led the CVF in 2022 to 2020 to 2022. And then Bangladesh has handed over the, handed over the presidency to Ghana. So I will not discuss about the uh, Troika that already the my previous presenters and the special guests have already mentioned. So um, I'll jump uh, to the next slide where you will see the international climate regime, actually how the blocks and different groups are actually negotiating. And this picture actually illustrates that how complex the climate negotiation itself it is. So from this figure, if you see the severe, it is 
actually under the para negotiation um, circle, you will see that um, uh, this uh, para negotiation um, actually um, uh, uh, position uh, place actually provide a step safe space for the countries to come together, test their ideas and put forward the proposal in direct relation to the formal negotiation. And they include parallel processes by which groups align and develop their positions. For example, basic and Katsinga dialogue do not negotiate together in the UNFCC, but coordinate and align their positioning, whereas ILAC, Association of Independent Latin American and Caribbean countries negotiate as a group and uh, coordinate. So why I am mentioning this or presenting this international climate regime so that you can correlate that why CPF is so important for Bangladesh's climate diplomacy. So with this brief background, the paper is looking for, uh, for uh, answers of these two questions that what are the initiatives and interventions that actually uh, so that Bangladesh can claim its leadership position in the CBF or in the climate regime. And we would, I would like to assess the leg legitimacy of this leadership. And uh, if anyone asks that why I am conducting this, this research, because uh, as we know that the climate justice and human rights issue is one of the core areas for the climate diplomacy of Bangladesh. And then again, it is actually um, uh, represent the country's overall image in the international fora. And as the previous uh, presenters also mentioned that it is kind of national branding of Bangladesh. So first I would like to uh, present some of the key features of the leadership so that you can get idea that how can we claim that Bangladesh as a climate leader. So leaders must have the creativity in action and uh, leadership, um, uh, it uh, should have the power to orient and to mobilize others for a purpose. And uh, it may arise controversies regarding motivation as the previous presenters also said, because the process is very much political. And then again, leadership is relational and competitive because as you are aware that new leaders are coming and emerging every year in every COP summits. And then again, it also sometimes depends on the numbers of followers. And then again, uh, prospective leaders does not focus on the common good for a limited su uh, success. Uh, while they are more focused on the good for the wider number of the uh, wider objectives. So uh, if we uh, summarize these um, concepts or the features of the leadership, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, divide it into two parts that uh, showing itself or herself as a leader and considered to be a leader by the others. So based on these two points, I would like to focus uh, some of the uh, concepts and the theories that I have used for analyzing the presidency of Bangladesh. Of course, there are a lot of uh, theories in the uh, leadership literature, but I have picked some of them which is very much relevant for the climate leadership. So if I see the structural or coercive leadership, I know many of you have uh, already uh, informed about the structural leadership, but for those who don't know about this uh, uh, definition, I would like to just uh, read out that refers to the deployment of power resources for the purpose of creating incentives and changing the cost and benefit associated with different avenues for actions in a particular um, issue area. And uh, for the second, intellectual or Directional leadership. So, um, the directional leadership actually rests on taking unilateral action and is accompanied, accomplished by the demonstration effects of leading by example. By making the first move, it is possible to demonstrate the feasibility, value, and superiority of particular policy solutions. 
And uh, if I uh, describe the third instrumental or problem solving leadership relies on negotiating skills and seeks to put uh, together deals that um, deals that would otherwise elude participants. Um, sorry for the it's not working. Oh, okay. Okay. So if I describe the leadership and if I analyze the activities or the initiatives, there is actually no evidence in the text suggesting that Bangladesh has the ability to provide um, uh, resources required to perform structural leadership. Uh, furthermore, there is no behavior found that would suggest that Bangladesh has attempted to exercise coercive action in order to achieve the certain interest. So, um, but regarding the intellectual uh, or the directional leadership, if we see that there are different um, activities that Bangladesh government has already taken during uh, her presidency, you will see that it has nicely shifted or uh, uh, I can say that uh, uh, shifted the narrative from the vulnerability to resilience and it has produced the midnight survival deadline and the Muji Prosperity Plan, uh, as you already know, and, um, the, uh, and the NDC reports of the, um, uh, along with the other 70 countries, and, um, uh, 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 and maintain a state bank with the Marshall Island and the multi-donor fund, um, um, uh, that is CVF and B20 for um, uh, giving support to, uh, the, during any emergency. And if we analyze the instrumental or the problem solving leadership of uh, Bangladesh's initiative, you will see that Bangladesh has already led CBF twice and it has increased its, uh, it has a great influence to increase its membership uh, during its two tenures. And then again, it has, um, uh, form, uh, it has um, uh, uh, categorized the five thematic ambassadors to give the um, uh, to um, uh, to enhance the effort, uh, effectiveness of the activities of the CVF, and then again it has established or it has successfully portrayed that it is a global lab for adaptation. That many countries are many developed, and the many developing vulnerable, non-vulnerable countries can come to Bangladesh and can learn about our adaptation practices and adapt our, our adapt and share their share our adaptation knowledge and then again there is a famous campaign uh, which is trying to you know uh, to circulate that the time to pay up which is actually very much similar to the climate um, green fund and other uh, other uh, adaptation fund which bangladesh and other vulnerable countries are actually claiming and then again, the second part of my presentation that what, would, what is the legitimacy of this leadership that whether Bangladesh can claim actually the, uh, uh, their, um, uh, uh, their presidency or their, or their supremacy in the climate negotiation. And there are several features and I will actually not describe this. These are the features because these are very common in the theoretical books and texts. So, and uh, as I have the time limit, so I will just go through this uh, concept because I will analyze these concepts and features in my later part of my presentation. So, there is, of course, there is some demand and supply side. If there is no demand for a leader, there is no need to grow the leadership. And then again, the normative formal leadership and um, social empirical leadership and 
proactive country in uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. And then again, the weak power and how a weak power can be a leader or can lead any climate change negotiation. And then again, the fast mover position, actually how a fast mover position can also give you the opportunity to lead something. So if I analyze this legitimacy that, uh, and this actually uh, uh, is not confined within the um, uh, presidency tenure, because if we want to um, uh, justify this legitimacy, we have to look the surroundings as well. So uh, the, if I consider that Bangladesh has a strong collaboration with the other negotiation alliance, for example, the Africa group, the LDC and the G77 and AOC's group. So which actually give Bangladesh a uh, better position to influence those groups and listen Bangladesh for their, for uh, its own purpose. And Bangladesh has a good number of expert climate negotiators and they are very much connected with the strong civil society. So who is actually not the top down, rather the down to top. So uh, this is a very good uh, example and a very good bend of, uh, um, uh, uh, of different um, uh, people from the different sectors. And uh, it has a good um, connection to borrow resources from all over the world, not through the government, but also from the non-estate actors as my previous uh, presenters also mentioned. And post the negotiator around the world, Salim sir is not here. I personally know that his organization actually conducting different types of training programs for the young diplomats and the youth group from around the world. So this is a very good initiative which actually legitimates our position. And then again, experience sharing with GIISs and NASA. I would like to um, describe this uh, section because, um, uh, 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 because considered by the UN institution as a role model to follow in disaster risk reduction, Bangladesh is Bangladesh actually is no longer just to draw attention to humanitarian crisis triggered by devastating floods and cyclones, but also for the lessons it is able to bring the rest of the world. The invitation by the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, in short GISS, a research center of the National Administration of US uh, Aeronautics and Space, in short NASA, Bangladeshi specialists of natural uh, disaster management to come and share their experience after Hurricane Sandy hit in New Year in 2012 is just an enlightening in this regard. And then again, the normative of formal leadership, as I mentioned earlier, that CVF led twice, and then again led LDC once, and Bangladesh has um, achieved the champion of the art award, which is very much prestigious, uh, for the, in the climate um, uh, negotiation um, and uh, uh, by UNEP. And then again, um, the Climate Resilience Fund mechanism, which is actually followed by, um, uh, I know that two countries uh, currently, Indonesia and Malaysia is following this Climate Resilient Fund. And then again, the proactive country in uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, uh, my previous speakers have already described all of these um, initiatives. I am just um, actually uh, putting this all these uh, 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 achievements into the theoretical um, framework. So adaptation approach over the mitigation, it is actually the main focus of our, cl our climate diplomacy and the most vulnerable, but most resilient. And the destination for the researcher who wants to observe the changes and explore the no regrets option in the COP summits.
So uh, Bangladesh, of course, has the legitimacy of claiming the moral leadership. So this, um, as Bangladesh is most vulnerable country, so it gives a moral uh, in, um, uh, leadership position that vulnerability, uh, this uh, vulnerability actually gives, uh, provide them the moral position of the moral leadership. And uh, as you know, that Bangladesh government has taken already a lot of initiatives and the national climate uh, framework, which actually also leg legitimate its moral leadership and then set example in the policy and making and use of renewable energy. And um, as I mentioned earlier, that Bangladesh is actually a weak power and uh, fast mover advantage because Bangladesh has taken a lot of initiative which actually uh, it has taken for the first time and then again followed by the other vulnerable countries and as a leaders of nations highly vulnerable to climate change we have a special responsibility to tackle these historic challenges which actually positioned Bangladesh uh, and claim uh, as a uh, claim its uh, leadership position and um, uh, then again I would um, as I mentioned earlier, that CVF is not a political alliance, uh, it's a political alliance, but not a negotiation block. But you know, there are a lot of countries from the Africa and from the Latin America, Caribbean and Pacific. They are also member of the CVF country, uh, CVF forum, uh, CVF, and they are actually belong to different, different negotiation blocks. So which actually give Bangladesh to give influence uh, over those uh, countries and those blocks. And then again, uh, resurgence of the real political impetus. If you see that uh, the, the, that the CVF can be a weak forum because this is the vulnerable countries, they, may, they are not maybe politically so much powerful, but sometimes they can create huge pressure so that you see that US also, uh, you know, refuse to, um, um, uh, from the Paris uh, agreement uh, in, uh, during, uh, I think COP21, um, you know, so it is actually um, there is the politic. They can create also political pressure of the um, uh, of a powerful state. And then again, uh, there are a lot of challenges. My previous speakers have already mentioned. So corruption and the lack of accountability in the climate governance, which we need to address seriously. And then again, uh, Bangladesh uh, graduation from the LDC that also my previous speakers have already mentioned. I have just want to point out one point that we are not now negotiating in the LDC group. So when we will be graduating, what will happen? Because what will be our negotiating position? We need to think of it. And then again, um, uh, 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 that, um, uh, that uh, often it is paralyzed between the powerful states because sometimes they cannot do anything because of the powerful states um, uh, in, the, in the global politics. Uh, so how can we overcome these uh, challenges? And thank you for your patient sharing. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sophia Hanam. Uh, short takeaways. Uh, the relevance of the uh, CVF, of course, has been highlighted and the importance of being uh, the leader within the CDF is also a reflection of the seriousness that uh, the leader takes the challenges that are out there for all of us. She also highlighted the shifting narrative uh, that Bangladesh has created from vulnerability to resilience and uh, uh, that Bangladesh is a global lab for adaptation uh, and have been recognized as a champion of the uh, 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 award. Uh, the floor is now open for discussion. After a, a very uh, informative, instructive series of papers that have been delivered by the four participants, I don't know how much there is more to ask. I think maybe this for to, uh, to clarification. But may I request that those who want the floor now to be brief, concise, and not uh, comment, but ask a very specific question and also verify to whom the question is directed, to which of the panelists. The floor is open. You have the floor. Please, Please introduce yourself and then. Thank you all the presenters. Actually, it is a discussion on climate diplomacy covering loss and damage, finance, CVF and all other issues. Uh, as uh, 
sir, Mr. Shamsan Mavin Chaudhary is here, Dr. Atiyah and others present here. Actually, we are discussing a lot of important issues, finance, finance adaptation, finance, access, loan and grant, a lot of things. But I think one important issue, it is not finalized. Actually, we are discussing on loss and damage, but Climate Finance Rikuti or Climate Displacement Center or, or some kind of migration. It is, there is no universal accepted definition as well as there is no legal backing, both nationally and internationally. I think it's one of the important crucial issues. That's why you cannot address the migration issue. As you know, internal migration is the country's responsibility. International though, climate migrant is not is not accepted in 1951 uh, declaration or universal human right maybe we can go through that way but some kind because sea level is rising we are vulnerable and in future it is become a very crucial issue for for diplomatic side provide groups or collective effort we can push for that for the definition one important issue and another important issue actually loss and damage uh, there is no funding window for loss and damage. We have adaptation meetings, although it's, we know the adaptation financing is very limited. It's loan based, grant based, but still, uh, if we can settle a loss and damage, that then we can address the uh, issue of uh, climate displaced people, poor peasants. You see, human rights perspective, we are losing 1% GDP according to the finance ministry's PA. It's around 4 to 5 billion now. We are 4 15 billion dollar our GDP. But nobody addresses their loss. Non government, no insurance company, not even internationally. They have no voice, they have no advocacy group or pressure group, but simply unaddressed. We are talking on loss and damage from 1991. Now it is 2022. Still, we are fighting to to establish a separate window for loss and damage. If we see that in human rights perspective, it is simply, simply, it is simply that ignores and simply cross violation of human rights. One one issue. Another issue actually, from our experience as a, as a member of the Bangladesh negotiating team for the last few years. Just just I'm concluded it that sometimes there is a window but the proper recipient who deserve to get the financing actually their access is not easy and to some extent nearly very complicated so it is not only the money it is access as well thank you thank you ambassador i'm sure you have the floor Very simple question. <clears throat> I want to know, there's been a lot of talk that Bangladesh is trying to <clears throat> shape itself as a, as a band. Now, I want to know, I have seen, you know, a lot of uh, views expressed by quite a, in many quarters that whenever a very important conference meeting takes place and it is over, then uh, the, the enthusiasm diminishes and very little action followed the promises. Since we Bangladeshis are trying to put ourselves up as a brand, what can we do and what have we tried to do to kind of get out of this trap that you know when promises are made to ensure that actions follow? Because you know, if we look at some of these things as an that have been happening in the last one year. Look at what happened in Florida. And to take an example in our own, in my own district, Sile, you know, we are very fast and very ominously falling behind uh, what we want to do. And if this trend continues, I think in the next three, four or five years, we'll be in a very terrible situation. So I want some enlightenment on the points I have made. I don't know to whom to address maybe Two persons, I think, Mr. Faisal and uh, Sophia Khanum. Thank uh, you. Professor Anwar, you have the floor, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman Slavin. I did not have any question, but specific comments in historical context. First, I would like to quote from Jubanangadar. Prithivin Gobhir Gobhirataru Ashuk Akhon. This is not simply because of corona pandemic, but also environmental degradation. And I think environment, the narrative of environment has yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I'm afraid the entire focus of today's discussion has been on today, but what about the yesterday? And today as well as the tomorrow. Don't forget that the Sahara Desert was about a thousand years ago full of green vegetation. And the Indus Valley civilization, the most urban civilization in the world, declined simply because of environmental degradation. There are about half a dozen causes suggested by historians, but recently the most important cause as identified by them is the environment of degradation. And there is indeed an interface between development and climate. There is an interface between development and climate. Finally, Mr. Chairman, sir, I suspect that the narrative on climate diplomacy is partial. It should be in a holistic manner in the context of environment. Environment is a macro concept, whereas climate is a micro concept. So our focus should be environment, not simply climate. Entire environment is threatened and faces challenge, unprecedented challenges. Finally, Mr. Chairman said, I quote again from Yubanandudash, Tabu Manushirin Pithibiri Kachi. So we have to said this word. About 55 nations are mostly vulnerable, but the entire world is at stake. Thank you very much. I thank all the presenters, special, my special kudos for Dr. Sufiya Khanum for relating the climate issue with leadership problem. This is purely an academic paper, but all the presenters are Actually, I'm indebted to them because of educating me on climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Now it's all 10 minutes to three, so I'll uh, limit uh, to only two more questions. Then we'll allow uh, the panelists to respond, and then we'll try to close uh, the session. Uh, yes, you have the floor. Please introduce yourself and also to whom you're addressing your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Farzana Parjhu, a climate activist from Fridays for Future. So my question is to Mr. Arif um, Rahman. You talked about youth diplomat, youth generation and all. So my question is how you and bodies are helping with creating this space and how they are uh, negotiating with our government so that they can put youth in the delegation. And I have another question to Mr. Mirja Shokotali. When you talk about mitigation and when we all talk about mitigation, how uh, we are addressing, or is there any mechanism to address false solution like uh, carbon capture or net zero by 2050, 2070, or something like carbon tax where the, um, Global North countries have the capacity to uh, emit and then tax, uh, pay the tax. So uh, I love to hear from both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a hand in the uh, Yes, you have the floor. 
Thank you, sir, for the floor. My name is M. Vishayan Sadiq. I work for CPD as a research associate. So what I've understood for the whole conference is about we are going fine with the governmental approaches, but mostly to combat the climate finance, we need to have a whole of society approach. And as my question is specific to two people, one is Arif M. Faisal and Dr. Sophia Khanum, is the importance of the non-state actors to be specific how the international organizations and the leadership approach can incorporate the local media in the whole procedure to have a bargaining tool towards the international media and create an impact for the climate finance and the diplomacy. So I want to shed light on the role of local media because it has been something which was pretty much unnoticed in today's presentation and how this can be maximized because the push mechanism the bargaining mechanism is something that we can really focus on as Bangladesh and as diplomacy. So how this is going to be maximized and incorporated in the whole procedure? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you have your floor. Last but one question. Thank you. My specific question to uh, Mr. Ari Foisel mentioned about uh, youth uh, engagement in negotiation, and it's truly needed. And Bangladesh signed in Children and Youth Declaration in COP25. And in the Glasgow Climate Pact, Bangladesh also signed this to more engagement in the Bangladesh delegation and negotiation. So my specific question to Mr. Shaukot, sir, to how the measures taken to engage young people in negotiation or delegation for the upcoming COP. And my specific question to uh, Ms. Sufia that Bangladesh uh, is a uh, uh, Bangladesh played a very vital role in the COP, but me, in case missed the youth engagement. But while Ghana taken the presidency, they appointed the youth ambassador. So how the CVF can engage more young people to ensure climate justice in global fight? Thank you. Very relevant question indeed. Last question, uh, Dr. Ati, of course, who has been dedicated most of his almost all of his professional life on this very issue. Yes, I think you have the floor. 45 years ago, when I first addressed the United Nations on climate change, uh, before I addressed it, I was declared a madman. Because, yeah, factually, that's correct. But that system did not even understand that there was a climate change. And that climate change was negative. Some people heard about climate change. Climate change is it. So what they essentially did, intellectually, they had confused Climate with weather. Weather does change rapidly. But climate is the summation of minimum 20 years of the summing up of weather. And that system to change was something people did not conceive. Because human horizon of thinking is about five years. Going 20 years is a bit. So when we started with climate change as a scientific phenomenon and started the science, it was quite challenging because the scientists knew the parts of it, but nobody saw the whole climate system. And changing is even more complicated because it's not in our perspective. So, but gradually it happened. And in Bangladesh in the last 20, 25 years, what I wanted to uh, say basically was to congratulate the government and the various scientists and institutions how much we have progressed over the last 20, 25 years. It's fascinating. Actually, most of the quality is as good as any part of the world. I just came back from a very big meeting where this is the level. So Bangladesh is moving correctly forward in the same way. Now our job and, and the government, to give them the credit, has had no resistance, no restriction on people doing this activity and encouraging the government and taking to them facts and figures. You know, I, I know Shafat, but I don't know if it's joining the job or many others. So the government, the community, the people, the scientists are working in harmony. And the experience of ordinary people, they can relate to it. They can explain them. So this is, so climate change has become far more real than it has ever been. And the difference between weather and climate to understand and take it systematically is not an intellectual and not an easy job. But uh, compared to, I mean, Britain, the United States, even those communities.
do not conceive that clearly. That partly because our life depends on Bangladesh's life depends on one of the greatest issues that controls our life, our economy, our growth parameters. And despite those facts, we are growing. One of the reasons we have recognized climate change, integrated climate change on planning process. You know, I've had a lot of discussion with planning minister and many others, and they have integrated, no resistance whatsoever. So this has been, I just wanted to say, congratulations to all the actors for integrating this and taking it uh, and, and taking it further. And that will help us to take our next step even faster because we have to grow much more rapidly now, industrially, even in agriculturally, and many other factors. So in 1971, I, I'll just stop up there. After 1971, when Bangladesh was born, we had food shortage for 7 million, uh, 70 million people. Now we have 75 million people. Now we have 170 million people who don't have rice stores. So that is what Bangladesh has done. Salute to the farmers, they have done it, but it needs the system, it needs creativity, it needs structures, it needs institutions, it needs government encouragement, it needs thinking. We haven't, you know, myself, Salim, some of us, we have created the center for various centers for climate change, but we don't yet have center of excellence created, and we should, because our younger scientists must be able to enter and think on the component part of it and do the research. We should know by now what is happening in Jasor that is peculiar to Dinajpur, different from Dinajpur to Dinajpur, different from Dhaka, and how should we strategize climate into our local level planning. We haven't done that yet, but we have to. So the knowledge that we have and the great achievement that we made, basing on that, we have to now institutionalize climate change within our development and push it further. So we have our development growth rate around 2%. We can easily make it 2.6, 2.83 even percent growth rate. So that would really take the country further if we can integrate climate change. Let me stop there. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Atik, for your very valuable comments. Um, I give the floor to the panelists to uh, answer the question that has been addressed to them. It's special the uh, request for an answer on the question on the institutionalizing the involvement of youth in this very major battle that we are all facing. So who uh, will the floor, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just want to uh, mention that uh, we, we are uh, almost at the final stage of preparing the national adoption plan. So youth and vulnerable groups has been adequately addressed uh, in that national action plan. So that will be reflected and in the future project proposals also there will be opportunity uh, to engage that youth. Thank you. And thank you, sir, for giving me the floor again. I just want to uh, I'll go one by one. So I would first like to address about the climate displacement, uh, which is actually my area of expertise. So I would like to mention some of the points regarding the climate displacement, because I just want to ask, do we have the statistics of the climate migrants? How many people are coming every day in Dhaka? In which point they are entering? We don't have any statistics, I'm sorry to say. And um, do we have any uh, specific statistics for what disaster they are coming? Because when people are actually planning to migrate, uh, like every disaster, they cannot migrate. Like if there is a slow onset disaster in the coastal area, their migration pattern is different for any sudden disaster. And we don't have any categorization regarding the disaster and how it is connected with each and every disaster, how they are migrating. And uh, as we, as you know, uh, that the migration concept is actually very merged with the other concept, like climate migrants is always merged with the economic migrants. And there are a lot of patterns. And uh, uh, actually, we don't have any statistics and we are, we don't know the entry points and we do not know what type of disaster is actually creating more migrants than the other type of disaster. 
So that is my uh, points. And another points I would like to uh, focus on the, um, uh, the media. Someone was asking about the local media that why we have not um, introduced uh, any information regarding the local media. So I was actually aware about this issue, but uh, due to the time constraints, I have not mentioned because you know that Bangladesh is doing very good in the locally led adaptation. Actually, who is carrying this news to the national level? I believe that the local level media is actually carry, carrying these messages. And of course, the non-state actors and the NGOs, those who are working at the grassroots level, they are actually, uh, you know, that carrying this message to the national level and from the national platform to the international platform. So it is, uh, although it is not reflected in our presentation, but um, personally, I believe that when I will write the, my paper, uh, definitely I will uh, focus on this because uh, for Bangladesh climate diplomacy, the root level negotiate, uh, root level um, uh, initiator or the actors are very much important to formulate our national level climate diplomacy. And sir, I'm very much um, grateful for your nice compliments. It means a lot for me. And I'm very much agree with you that the term should use the environment, not the climate, because it's narrowed down the scope. And uh, ethically, I am, uh, of course, uh, agree with you uh, in, in one point that uh, our, I, I speak in Bengali, that our domestic helper are working, our driver are working for us, but our policymakers, like the policymakers, Jesha policymaker, their Bashai, domestic helper, Rakatputchen, Tadirke, their driver, Tipotidin, office in Yedachen, She policymaker, Jokon, Tabile Boshe, policymaking Kurchen, does he or do they thinking about that where these people will live? So the informal settlements are growing and um, we are not thinking. So the climate migrants, when they are coming to the city, they are actually taking place in the abandoned places or near the drainage or the places which is actually not livable. So actually there are a lot of gray areas in this uh, diplomatic uh, talks, diplomatic narratives. Um, and I think there are, uh, we are in the um, so, um, discussing here about the climate diplomacy that, but how many people, those who are actually suffering from the climate extreme environment, how many of them are here in this room? So actually we need to think about that. And I uh, actually agree with Sohan that um, you have mentioned about the youth engagement. And uh, as a female um, panelist here, uh, the only panelist, that how many uh, women representatives are in the negotiation team, even in Bangladesh. So uh, we, we need to think about that because every, every uh, categories, every social status, they have different needs. So we must need to think about it. And uh, I think I have covered almost all the questions. And thank you, sir, for your uh, Apik, sir, for uh, for the nice uh, comments. And uh, definitely, it has uh, like the climate and weather. And uh, I think it is uh, also we need to think about. We don't have any very good study that how actually climate change is actually affecting our national security. This has conducted in 2008. That is the only one uh, like root level. We have done the survey. We have done the field work that how it is actually affecting the national security of Bangladesh. We don't have such type of a study. And if uh, unfortunately, I must want to mention here because when I was looking for the um, academic articles, even for the climate diplomacy, most of the authors are coming from the European countries. Very few of the authors have written the South Asian climate diplomacy and climate and diplomacy is very much connected with the cultural component. And unfortunately, our academician and also I am, we, we don't have very much literature on the South Asian climate diplomacy. So we need to think of it again. So I would like to conclude with one um, that, uh, that is very common in diplomacy. I should not uh, speak it in front of Sar, but I must want to say that know yourself and know others. Let others to know ourselves. So only this will bring the positive transformation. With this, thank you.
uh, <clears throat> I'll request uh, Arif to respond if you can what are your questions for the on international organization. Thank you. Uh, I would like to address the question from Farjana and Sohanur. You mentioned about what we are doing to engage you. Actually, UN have a organization, you know, we provide actually travel support to participate youth in COP for young group. And uh, we also conduct support uh, youth consultation. So we have already conducted, uh, Shokot Bhai already mentioned about this thing, pro-formulation of national adaptation plan and nationally determined contribution. We engage a lot about, and we acknowledge actually your role in uh, climate resilient development and green growth. Uh, you mentioned about that, uh, could we propose net zero by 2050 or carbon tax or polluter pay principle? If you see our eight, five year plan, that is clearly mentioned about in a chapter A about, and there is a clear direction about how we can promote actually the green growth. Uh, one of our colleagues in, in mentioned about how we can engage actually the media and journalists. You know, we need to create very good story, good narrative, and to show in international audience. So once upon a time, Bangladesh was a poster child for climate victim. Kind of we show all the in newspaper and BBC and, and, and international media about our flooding. But nowadays we need to show our resilience. We need to show our prosperity and you are the ambassador for branding Bangladesh. And uh, lots of newspaper, particularly Dhaka Tribune, they prepare the supplementary monthly supplement. And uh, Channel I, they also advocate, they have a dedicated program for Prokriti Jibon and they discussed about this thing a lot. And there is also uh, Bangladesh Environmental and Climate Journalist Association and there is a good member of this thing. They regularly organize various consultations and they publish lots of things. Uh, Ambassador uh, Jia, Shahib mentioned about something that uh, there is a very little action on uh, climate finance on loss and damage assessment. Actually, there is no uh, national framework on addressing loss and damage associated with climate change, how to fund the loss and damage uh, relevant to slow onset event and extreme event. Uh, this is a still very evolving issue and we are still at the learning curve. So Bangladesh is advocating and bringing all other vulnerable countries to act together. And there is a, some mechanism had already framed, Warsaw International Mechanism, Santiago Network, there is also committee form, but the methodology for making a, a climate attribution in, you know, loss and damage association associated with climate change is not yet established by the scientific community. So this is science is making lots of features and hopefully soon there will be some uh, success in this area. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I will, uh, sorry, okay, you have it. Uh, um, there is a question on CCS, carbon capture and storage. Actually, um, this technology is very sophisticated and that is feasible for um, countries with, um, I mean, mining or, like Australia, they have uh, huge mining opportunities where they can uh, store this um, carbon, carbon capture this carbon and sell it. But there is also possibility that there could be leakage. So it is not proven and it's very difficult to maintain this one. So that is not feasible for, feasible for Bangladesh. On net zero, we, we are not yet um, developed our like long-term low emission development strategy. So once we develop this, then we can uh, identify the year when we'll uh, achieve the net zero for Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is such an important issue. I think one can go and, and talk on it for days and days and days. And the world has been doing talking. Yes, there have been a lot of talking over the last two or three decades. And uh, <clears throat> I come back to the questions of uh, the point raised by Professor Anwar Hussain that the world is paying a price for 
mistakes made by the people who are occupying the world, the planet who are occupying it, they are doing damage to it. Uh, I, I, there is a conflict of goals between, between your development goals and fighting climate change. This is a natural, uh, this is a, a realistic situation. I remember when I was <clears throat> posted in China in the 80s, there was a famous saying going around in Beijing that you have to be gray before you become green. The problem is that we have remained on being gray for far too long. And we have really not seriously moved towards an attempt to be. We credit our garment industries for the marvelous work they have done in uh, making Bangladesh an export oriented country. But what damages have been done to our rivers through pollution? Many of our rivers have now become canals and they may not even exist even in our lifetime. And again, this is where I talk with the point of conflict of. Uh, goals, development goals, and protecting your climate. Of course, uh, Dr. Atik, my friend, was extremely knowledgeable and has long experience. People like him, Salim ul uh, and the rest of them have done a great deal of academic work, research work, have highlighted the problem. But I think Dr. Atik was hinting at having it in a more structured forum, bringing all the best heads and making the youth part of this whole process. And hopefully we will see a, a greener world. If not we, maybe our grandchildren will be able to see a path towards a greener world. I would like to thank uh, the BISS, the chairman, and the acting director general uh, for the well-timed uh, meeting. And this is where public diplomacy becomes very, very important because you really open your mind, don't restrict yourself to what the uh, state or the government is thinking. Uh, I also thank uh, Sophia for the excellent point she's made on the importance of uh, leadership uh, of uh, GVF, what you need to do. But just getting leadership is not enough. What you deliver as a leader, I think is very, very important. It's not just getting more numbers, but actually delivering in quality not just in quantity. Um, again, I thank the ISS, and uh, I think we can now bring this session to a close. Thank you. Thank you, respected chair of the session and distinguished panelists for your insightful presentation. Thank you, respected audience, for your active engagement. I now request you all to join us for a humble lunch, which is served right outside the auditorium. Our this faculty member will guide you to the designated places. Thank you once again. <laughs>